Well, welcome everyone to this third session of the Cosmic Brain uh, Roundtables. Um, most of you have been joining during the last session these past few days, but for those that are joining us today, either online or physically for the first time, um, yeah, so you know, Cosmic Brain is a part of the Lab 03 uh, Synthetic Minds, which are experimental laboratories that we do here in Media Lab um, every six months. And in the case of Lab 03, we are exploring how the deliberate composition of different kinds of intelligence at very different scales, both temporal but also um, uh, a spatial could shape the future of not only society but the future of the whole planet. Uh, within the Lab 03, as we always do, we are doing a critical studies program, uh, which is why we are here today. We're joined by uh, an amazing cohort of minds that goes from design, art, science fiction, uh, philosophy, um, and different um, academic positions, we're exploring uh, key topics, you know, in relation with artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence that couldn't be more on point if we have in, in mind, uh, you know, these very hot days regarding the, the whole drama around open AI. Um, specifically, we are wondering if alignment with uh, AI is possible, and if it is, uh, what kind of new semiotics or languages or gestures shall we develop to implement a proper coexistence with these new kind of entities. Um, the program has three main parts, uh, a, psych, a cinema cycle that ended up just yesterday with the second film that we, we saw. The first day we saw uh, Ex Machina and yesterday we were lucky enough to see uh, The Arrival, also, you know, um, unfolding a very, key, a very interesting conversation after the movie. The second part of the program is these roundtables that you are right now, which we had two sessions already. This is the third and the final one. And to wrap up uh, the program on Saturday, we invite you to this Open Symposium Plus uh, performance, uh, where we will showcase some of the, not results, but um, you know, some of the highlights of the different ideas we have been sharing and putting on top of the table in the last few days. Uh, directing and curating the program is uh, one of the mentors of the Lab 03, which is our beloved Ed Kellers, here with us, whose research and practice explores the structures of feeling which link cultural, infrastructural, ecological, and technosocial systems, revealing emerging terrestrial and cosmopolitical potential. He's a designer, professor, writer, and technologist, but also a musician, as you will see if you come on Saturday. And with Carla Leitao, that I know she's joining also today with us through Zoom, is the co-founder of Spec AE, Alm Studio. Uh, and he has been teaching during the last, um, since 1996, a very interesting different kind of, of, of contexts and institutions, uh, from the New School of Parsons to GSAP, SciArc, um, also, he's a affiliate researcher on the Ethereum program, and now we are lucky enough to have him with, with us today. Joining him in the panel today is also uh, different people that have been joining during the uh, last few days. So we have the, the whole crew today, Peter Watts, Julie Teranda, and Anita biswas Melanthi. but I will allow Ed to uh, welcome them and introduce them. So thank you so much, Ed, and looking forward to the session of today. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, everybody at the, at the Media Lab again for this fantastic uh, event and the support of the event. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is um, introduce everyone on the panel today, and then I'll, I'll give just a three or four minute comment uh, introduction to some of the themes that we're going to cover today and tie them into the conversations we've had over the past couple of days uh, to orient you. <clears throat> Julieta Aranda is going to lead out the conversation today uh, on the panel. Julieta is an artist and editor of EFLUX Journal and co-director of the EFLUX online platform since 2003. In her artistic practice, she composes sensorial encounters with the nature of time and speculative literature. She observes the altering human-Earth relationship through the lens of technology, AI, space travel, and scientific hypotheses. Working with installation, video, and print media, she's invested in exploring the potential of science fiction, alternative economies, and the poetics of circulation. Her projects challenge the boundaries between subject and object while embracing chance encounters, auto-destruction, and social processes. 
Nandita biswas Malamfi, who led out the discussion yesterday on the panels. Nandita is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science, an affiliate member of the Department of Women's Studies and Feminist Research, and director of the electro governance group, The Egg, at Western University in London, Ontario, Canada. She's also served as acting associate director of the Center for the Study of Theory and Criticism at Western. Her areas of study are situated at the intersection of political theory, continental philosophy, and media theory, focusing on the political dimensions of contemporary neurosciences, technosciences, and in addition, works of speculative science fiction. She's author of The Three Stigmata of Friedrich Nietzsche, Political Physiology in the Age of Nihilism, and is the co-editor with Dr. Dan Malamphy of The Digital Dionysus, Nietzsche and the Network-Centric Condition. Her ongoing research and writing examines surveillance states, algorithmic governance, the politics of perception management, and what she calls larval warfare. Peter Watts, who led out our first discussion three days ago, is a former marine biologist, author, the survivor of flesh-eating disease, and in the US at least, a convicted felon whose novels, despite an unhealthy focus on space vampires, have become required texts for university courses ranging from philosophy to neuropsychology. His work is available in 24 languages, has appeared in 34 best of year anthologies, and been nominated for 59 awards. His list of 22 wins includes the Hugo, the Shirley Jackson, and the Seiyun. He lives in Toronto with fantasy author Caitlin Sweet, a placostomist the size of a school bus, and I now know what a placostomist is, and a dynamic assortment of mainly feline tetrapods. Uh, we will also be joined by a few people online today. Uh, we'll be joined by Carla Letao, who I'm fortunate to call my partner in crime and in life. Carla is an architect, professor, and writer. She's an assistant professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic School of Architecture since 2010. Her studios and seminars explore the intersection of architecture, urban systems, technology, ubiquitous cultures, and immersive VR. She is the co-founder of AUM Studio and Spec AE, which researches architectural design, curation, theory, scenarios, and interactive media. She's a local representative in Lisbon, Portugal, of CITREP, an international design school, and curated, organized, and designed the event Portugal Now and the Cornell AAP Folio with an exhibit of over 20 Portuguese offices and conferences in Ithaca and New York City. She was a contributor to the Huffington Post design section. Exhibitions and installations include Proto Spaces at the Italian Virtual Pavilion Venice Biennale 2021, Thinking Forest Fabbed Fields at the Venice Biennale 2018, Suture at SciArc Telic Gallery Los Angeles back in 2005, Global Design NYU, Ischte Portugal, and True Romance at Stuttgart, Germany um, at the Schloss Solitude program. We'll also be joined by Dr. Ben Gertzel via Zoom. Ben is a cross-disciplinary scientist, entrepreneur, and author. He leads the Singularity Net Foundation, the OpenCog Foundation, and the AGI Society which runs the annual Artificial General Intelligence Conference. Dr. Gertzel also chairs the futurist nonprofit Humanity Plus, serves as chief scientist of AI firms Rejuve, Mindplex, Cogito, and Jam Galaxy, all parts of the Singularity Net ecosystem, and serves as a keyboardist and vocalist in the Desdemona's Dream Band, Jam Galaxy Band, the first ever band led by a humanoid robot. Uh, we're also joined by a number of other folks across the panels in the room today, David Roden uh, and Bonnie Brusaden. And we may be joined by one other person on Zoom, Troy Therrien, who joined us yesterday. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll hold the introductions there and just try to do a, a quick recap of some of the key themes that we've been covering and uh, set up the framework for Julieta to, to launch into our discussion and session today. As Eduardo said, we've been looking at certain key problems that are of interest to both science fiction writers today and AI developers. At the core of this would be speaking with the alien. And the alien, of course, can be literally the alien, something that comes from off planet, or it could be the alien on planet, speaking with animal life, speaking with dolphins, speaking with ecosystems, communing with radically different other humans who are just fundamentally different from us. Speaking with the alien also includes speaking with AI. And at the core of this question of what it means to communicate with AI is what it means to align with AI. And as Eduardo mentioned, we asked the question, is alignment possible? It's difficult for humans to align with each other, as we see in the constant strife and warfare across the surface of our uh, uh, planet. This old planet spinning round, it's a wonder tall trees ain't laying down, as Neil Young said a very, very long time ago. So what would it mean for alignment to take place? 
What are the kind of mechanisms that we need to put in place for that alignment? The films that we saw in the film cycle, Ex Machina and Arrival, deal quite directly with the idea of linguistics, communication, miscommunication, alignment, misalignment, both on Earth through AI and robotics and off planet through the arrival of an alien species. Peter Watts, who's joining us uh, from Canada, is the author of Blindsight, Echopraxia, other, many other short stories, the Rifters trilogy, and in all of Peter's work, at the core is a question of whether communication without loss is possible. Uh, Nandita biswas Malamfi, who spoke yesterday, did a deep dive on Frank Herbert's Dune, on Egyptian hieroglyphics, on communication and arrival, and what it would mean for linguistics to begin to take up a trans-temporality, addressing other temporalities beyond the ones that we normally deal with. Nandita mentioned the temporalities of Ion, Kronos, and Kairos. And we'll hear from Julieta today. I wanted to touch on a couple of other themes that we, that we have covered. Uh, we've been looking at this question of synthetic minds and universal gestures. Nandita's work has, has done a very, very deep dive into the question of gesture, gestural ecologies, gestural diagrammatologies, I've been working on this in my music meets gesture work for the past five or six years. And the question then becomes, what does it mean to insist on what today's AI developers feel is a crucial addition to the large language models and foundation models? What does it mean to insist on multimodality? What does it mean when we say we can't only use language or language plus image, but we need to use sensory systems, gestures, sonics, we need to have sensors deployed, and in his work, Benjamin Bratton has looked at this extensively. Ben will join us on Saturday for the symposium. What does it mean when the entire surface of the planet has become a sensorial skin reporting back not only to humans, but also to machine systems, and reporting increasingly to each other? More machines, perhaps, talk to each other now than they talk to humans or humans to machines. So this question of multimodality and the gesture is one core question at the center. Uh, again, Peter dealt with this intensively in his novel Blindsight, foregrounding the questions of translation and communication between human and alien minds. And Nandita dealt with it yesterday in her engagement with Arrival. We're also asking today, perhaps, as well as in the, the concept of alignment, what it would mean to consider the design, the deployment, and the use of micro worlds and pocket universes. And when I was writing the brief, I asked the question, if alignment is not possible, what might be the cosmopolitical alternatives enabled by only partial communication, gestural communication, and what would micro worlds and pocket universes make possible? A micro world is a test space, a toy world, within which as a simulation an AI can learn a baby playground for an AI, as Ben Gertzel has said. What is a pocket universe? We see an example of a pocket universe at the very end of Chish and Lu's trilogy, the three-body problem, Dark Forest and Death's End. It's a place where a species takes refuge, actually several species take refuge, essentially at the end of the universe, before the birth of another universe. But I would argue also that the concept of micro world or pocket universe is almost infinitely scalable. A single gesture can be a micro world or a pocket universe. A single musical phrase can launch an entire universe unto itself. A single taste that you experience when you're eating a fantastic dinner can be a kind of a punctum of a micro world. And so this ability to scale from the incredibly local, in fact, not only your sensorium as a self, as a human, but the subset cells inside you, the cells inside your body, small clusters of neurons, genetic inherited information, as J.G. Ballard says, that goes back hundreds of millions of years and yet still functions in us. Those scales all the way up to the scale of our solar system, our planet, our solar system, our galaxy. This is the kind of framework for the questions that we're asking in the cosmic brains Roundtables, And this is why we, we called it Cosmic Brains, because we want to look for possibly universal frameworks out of which cognition, sentience, and sapience would emerge. 
Arguably, humans are sapient. We can think about thinking. We can perceive ourselves thinking. We can develop metacognitive cycles as we perceive ourselves thinking. What were the conditions necessary for that to emerge on top of this framework of our bodies and our evolutionary heritage? Um, and again, I think everybody who's joining us today has dealt with this, with this quite directly in their work. Um, it's been a really intense three days. I, I just want to say, and Eduardo and the Matadero team and I had talked about this, one of the hopes that I've had, and, and everyone here who I've been at, at, at events with over the past 20 years in some cases or more, uh, I have hoped to find places where a connection that wasn't possible before would take place. And this was what drove a conference that Ben Gertzel and I put together back in 2016. I was looking for ways that people on both the left and the right in political philosophy, Nick Land was at that conference, people who were working on the theory and philosophy of mind, people who were in the trenches, AI developers, would find overlaps and connections. And that's the driving force behind bringing this group of people together once again this week. Um, so I hope that some sparks can emerge out of this. Uh, the conversations have been amazing over the past couple of days. And uh, with that, I'll hand it off to Julieta. Thank you, everybody. Um, hi. Uh, OK, so I'm always uh, <clears throat> a little bit nervous when I have to do these things because I am mostly an artist. And I try to be working outside of language to make my work. Uh, nonetheless, with a big reference to research. So I, it's like always like a stop and go um, situation where I want to ask questions, but just enough that I don't get the answers right, so I can then make work that deal with, uh, with the potential answers. Because if I give the answers in language, then I don't need to make work. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, it's this constant struggle. And uh, I'm really um, in awe of uh, sharing a space with people that actually do use language properly as a medium. So it's uh, I'm fangirling like hard over these people here. Um, <clears throat> so, um, what I wanted to be looking at um, is design itself, right? Uh, before getting into intelligence or what it is that's being designed, um, is uh, just the act of designing, not just um, LLMs and artificial intelligence, but um, what it is that design produces beyond use value. Um, and if, like, trying to tie that to, to artificial intelligence, right? What it is that we are um, referring to with the word artificial. Um, is it the opposite of natural, or is it um, something that uh, has to do with um, it being man-made, or something that has to do with the materials that are used, right? So is it uh, is synthetic biology an artificial field? Is um, like, uh, what is that? Uh, and artificial intelligence, I think we have talked about silicon um, uh, on the first day. So what happens if silicon is not a substrate upon which an intelligence is being um, deployed, right? So um, I, I mean, like I'm opening with this because I, I think of design as a, as a field that focuses uh, more than most uh, on the materials that it chooses and on how these materials uh, influence future designs and the designs themselves and how they function. And um, like pushing forward towards the design of intelligence, um, I want to think that the materials that we end up using or that end up being used uh, and will end up influencing the design its, of intelligence, its interior world and the image that it has of itself. Um, I, wanted, I, I want to show you a film of mine. Um, so I am going to cut for a second for nine minutes and then I come back uh, mm -hmm. talking. So just let me get to the, uh, where are you? Uh, you are here, I think you are here, uh, full screen. View, full screen and play. I know it very well, so I don't need to watch it. Uh, 
on a subject of health, scientists recently revived an ancient, giant Siberian virus, 30,000 years old, found in ice. And guess what? It's still infectious. trapped or trapping, predator or prey. Nobody teaches life anything. desire. The alternative is to accept that one is a defective biological unit resigned to extinction.
There's part two and part three, but I don't show those now. Um, and how do I get out of this? You uh, exit full screen. Okay. Um, now I have a. Uh, uh, we get into legibility and all the other nice things that I wanted to uh, talk about. Um, uh, one thing I'm sorry about, the, I think the text in the video goes too fast. I read very fast and I always make things to my own reading speed and get a lot of complaints afterwards. So somebody else should do my subtitles. Um, apologies if you could not read the whole thing. Um, this is an image. Um, come here. Can we see it? No, we cannot see anything. Oh, yeah. We can, we can see it? Okay, let's go full screen. Full screen? Can I go full screen? Yeah, full screen, yes. Ah, that's, an, oh, that's not a good one. Hold on. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm showing you also the this one better, maybe? Yeah, that's better. So this is... Um, I'm just like the, doing um, <laughs> like a little delayed illustration of something that we were discussing yesterday. This is the work of an artist called Pierre Bismuth. And what it is, is uh, he's tracing the hand of, the movements of the hand of uh, Marilyn Monroe throughout the entire movie of uh, Gentleman Preferred and Blonde. And this is like Marilyn Monroe's right hand. And uh, there is an uh, issue of uh, writing being performed and of legibility and uh, a tracing of gesture over time, right? So I'm... Uh, I brought this image for uh, Nandita specifically, Amazing. and I can start talking um, with this image as a background. Oh, fantastic. So, um, um, uh, so a question then, uh, thinking about design and thinking about some of the other questions and answers that I am posing in the first part of stealing one's own corpse. Um, I am pondering um, what is the model of intelligence that we are using both to design AIs and to attempt to communicate with others, other than humans, uh, other than anything, um, other than known, let's say. Um, and the, the, the one model that we have most readily available to us is, the, is human intelligence, which of course um, is just a slice of the spectrum of what uh, general intelligence uh, can potentially be. What we see, taste, experience as human is directly related to our neck up intelligence which, and uh, perception and to our relationship to time. It is, if you will, a matter of speed and scale. Um, I, I, have been spent, I have spent quite some time trying to look for a definition of time uh, that goes beyond uh, what St. Augustine um, says of, uh, about time like a definition that I can live with and think with and work with. And the closest I have come to that is the proposition of saying that time is a function of change. Um, and that it, uh, so this has to do with, and I'm sorry I wrote this today, so it's a little bit uh, jumpy. Um, the, when we are designing uh, to, to try to extend this, uh, that slice that we have available to us, right? Uh, we can think of, uh, design as prosthetic, as something that augments us. And so while the artificial intelligences that we are aiming for are, in a sense, modeled after us, they are also able to go beyond our material limitations. Um, at the moment, that translates into models and representations that help us in the parsing of invisibles, of deep space, of subatomic worlds, nebula, high-speed trading, what have you. Um, but Taking uh, a speculative leap of faith towards the point where an artificial intelligence is self-aware to the point where it can't predict internal models of itself, a number of questions come up. The intelligence is aware of the fact that it is, um, but it also most probably knows what it is and what it is not. It is not human. It looks at its own materials, its composition, and how does it use them to make sense of the world and to in turn produce and design worlds. And to what extent are those 
further, uh, this uh, further worlds compatible with human, and not just compatible, but propitious? Or are these unintelligible, opaque, perhaps hostile propositions where the AI continues designing and augmenting itself, not only catering to us, but with attention rather to the capacities that they have that go beyond our own human material and perceptual limits. And here I'm thinking about, you know, like mushrooms growing on mushrooms, like a mycel my mycelium growing on top of a mycelium and meshing together. And what we see of these processes down the line is, is just the mushrooms, fruiting bodies every now and then. If we see anything at all, it's just the fruits on occasion. Um, and I think this, uh, this is at the core of the tension between um, our desire and our fear of contact and communication with others. Um, and I that's also think that's at the core of the mechanisms that we try to build into, into our designs. Uh, everything from the three laws of robotics to thinking of empathy as the ultimate boundary. Um, there is a demand uh, where we may, that we make of, uh, of this designed intelligence, where it must pass, it should pass, but it shouldn't completely surpass. And um, if take, taking a look at the often gendered representations of artificial intelligences, from Sofia to Ava and Kyoko from Ex Machina, and uh, what the rudimentary version of like Siri, like your perfect assistant, um, what we see is like, I, I don't know, like, a, like overachieving assistants, uh, Girl Fridays, uh, bank maid, um, perfect girlfriends. And there is a subtext of the proposed relationships, which are essentially those of master and slave, always subservient. And thus, like slave masters, we live with latent fear of our sentient tools that become more than tools revolting against us. And here is the quote from um, Other Lord, right? The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And now, in the context of a self-aware augmented intelligence, how do we interpret that? Is there an agency to the AI that comes with awareness so that it becomes more than a tool? Or its condition as a tool prevents it from dismantling the uh, pr uh, proverbial master's house? Um, I don't have answers to any of these, of course, but I, I like that these kinds of questions always push me against the limit of imagination. And, and try as I might, I can't quite uh, come up with a, pic a picture of what is on the other side. Um, and that limit point of imagination um, is, I, I guess, something that we try to cross um, with the message in a bottle type of objects that we send out as attempts to communicate, like a Tesla or a golden record. Um, and in these attempts to, uh, to communicate, of course, um, something to take into account is uh, our relationship to ourselves in time and, and how very bad we are at long durée. Um, um, as we try to encode, decode, and uh, read uh, communications uh, coming from far away and far beyond uh, in time and space. Um, once, you know, we should remember that we can barely read and decode ourselves over time. Like the Mayan, uh, you know, uh, whatever is inscribed in Mayan pyramids, like hieroglyphics, uh, like the amount of forgetting that took even, that, the amount of forgetting that took place um, with, uh, during the pandemic with uh, with flight systems, right? So many people were fired from airlines, pilots, uh, security, traffic controllers, and we have not yet managed to reestablish air flight to what it was three years ago, because in the in institutional memory was lost, and that kind of um, flow of information has not yet been reestablished. So, um, thinking of ourselves from the perspective of a 4D world, um, the human is in need of translation to self, from human to human over time. Um, not just in terms of language, but in, in terms of uh, encoding and meaning. Um, and if we add on to this the layer of pre-planned obsolescence that comes with late capitalism, um, in, we end up with uh, models of communication, like something like that's very sobering. It's what, something that happened with the um, ISEE3 in 
this is something that uh, Stanislav Lem mentions in Summa Technologia, uh, where it says, um, the reason we shall not see the presence of intelligence in outer space is not because it is not there, but rather because its behavior defies our expectations. In other words, we assume that once we receive the message, all that is left is cracking the code. But that is assuming that we can recognize that there is a message to begin with. And Something that, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with what happened with the ISEE-3, the, uh, the International Sun-Earth Explorer, uh, which was sent out uh, in 1978 as the, and here I'm reading, it's not so much, um, which became the first liberation point mission about the Sun-Earth L1 point. Four years later, a complex series of lunar uh, swing bys and small propulsive maneuvers ejected ISEE-3 from the Earth-Moon system to fly by a comet, uh, jacobini sinner for the first time in 1985, as the recrescent uh, International Cometary Explorer, ICE. In its heliocentric orbit, ISEE-3 uh, slash ICE, slowly drifted around the Sun to return to Earth's vicinity in 2014. Maneuvers in 1986 targeted a 2014 August 10 lunar swing by to recapture ISEE-3 into Earth orbit. In 1999, ISEE-3 slash ICE passed behind the Sun. After that, tracking of the spacecraft ceased and its control center was shut down. In 2013, um, as the date for the ISEE uh, approached, uh, approach uh, came approach. Um, uh, there were uh, meetings were held to assess the viability of re reawakening ISEE-3, and the goal was to target the 2014 lunar swing by to recapture the spacecraft back into uh, the halo of Sun Earth L1 orbit. However. The special hardware for communicating with the spacecraft, uh, spacecraft via NASA's Deep Space Network Station was decommissioned after 1999, and NASA had no funds to reconstruct the lost equipment. So it became impossible to communicate with that object that we had sent ourselves a modest three decades prior. Um, uh, so that's, uh, I mean, like these are, these are things that I just keep uh, thinking as uh, problems of design, but uh, us as a faulty, like really faulty units, right? The, um, some years ago, when uh, we were working on the Summa Technologia seminars uh, in the middle of the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, is, an, is an example that has stayed in my mind since when thinking about design. Um, in, in one of the seminars that he and Carla held, uh, Ed showed us the image of an albatross that was dead on the beach with a belly full of big lighters. And he encouraged us to look at that image as a problem of design. The designer did not, of the lighter did not intend for the albatross to die. The lighter had an entire different purpose, but nonetheless, he designed something that has a latent ability or capacity to kill albatrosses because they look at the lighter and say to themselves, oh my, shiny, colorful bit of thing, I must eat this. Um, so that, those kinds of, you know, what is that we are building into the things, the intelligences, the systems that we are designing? Um, and I am still trying to make sense of the last, uh, you know, the collective uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and whatever has happened in the last uh, three years. Um, so, uh, how, uh, as we emerge from this uh, global lockdown, the, the main thing, uh, the main theme, as, as it should be, of course, is uh, uh, another, pos you know, an end of the world, an extinction. And, and uh, it's something that becomes, I, I guess it's because during the, during the pandemic, we, of course, had to, had to you know, confront that and to try to parse the difference between uh, extinction and apocalypse. And you know, apocalypse being as something that is um, related to justice, something that can be witnessed. And uh, I mean, like, 
then you, of course, you have to think what's that arc of justice and how it, you know, once you start triage things that are not human, it becomes really tricky. With humans, you can say good, bad. With giraffes, microbes, and jellyfish, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, how do you separate the wheat from the shaft when you are talking about uh, paramecium?s um, And uh, in terms of extinction, which is uh, the, what happens to the one species that's supposed to enact justice, uh, it becomes more and more relevant as it closes in around us. We have been, um, we have been modeling, predicting, anticipating, and perhaps also wishing, not a conscious wish, but a pulse, uh, a drive, to have a front seat to the event of extinction. And I'm going back to the pandemic because all of the theorizing about the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And one of the main hypotheses was that it was uh, man-made in a laboratory in Wuhan. An optimized virus produced as part of gain of function research. Um, as opposed to being something that jumped across the imaginary species barrier because of the friction of worlds that are constantly rubbing onto one another. Um, and uh, same as with that overused Bahavad Gita destroyer of worlds quote, there is some comfort to be gained in being the architects of our own destruction as opposed to passive spectators to it. Uh, so in a, if I want to be a little bit optimistic, I can say that we can also think that way, no, not that one, another end of the world is possible and use um, the risk of annihilation as a source of propulsion. Um, and I am a, so uh, last, the, the last thing I want to bring up is uh, the concept of, uh, is uh, Mary Louise Pratt's concept of uh, what a contact zone is. And the contact zones are described or defined as social spaces where disparate cultures meet, clash and grapple with each other, often in contexts of highly asymmetrical relations of power such as colonialism, slavery, or their aftermaths, as they are lived out in many parts of the world today. And I want to argue that contact zones are not merely conflict. These are patchwork ecologies on even conditions of more than human and more than two livability in landscapes increasingly dominated by industrial forms and with all the generative potential of friction and snacks and where the need to maintain heterogeneity is patent. Um, Patchy Anthropocene is a conceptual tool for noticing landscape structure with a special attention to what we call um, modular simplification and feral pro pro blah, proliferations. And uh, like this is something that's like, trying to suggest guidelines for thinking about more than human social relations. And uh, I'm skipping that. And so, uh, 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 and that is like uh, trying to to use ecological modeling, political and economy, and, alter and alternative cosmologies as system experiments that is uh, trying to use the contact zone as a positive thing. These are systems that should rub against each other, right? Like they, on the friction, something happens. It's about not avoiding the conflict entirely, but since that rubbing needs to be happening, um, it's a, then let's make it into a better conflict, into a more generative. Uh, actual productive conflict. And um, on the digital arena, uh, how do we negotiate contact zones from anything? Uh, I mean, let's bring it from multi species terrains to, the, to human and more than human uh, habitats to the tension between AI and human labor. Um, is this tension a product of cruel optimism, that is, dreams that are impossible because they are sheer fantasy, or else? dreams that are too possible and toxic, and this in terms of what it is that we are expecting um, automated labor uh, to, and AI to do for us, right? Uh, beyond the assembly line and into the outsourcing our creative capabilities and capacity of synthesis. Um, the second concept that I wanted to bring uh, in to close be, uh, beyond the contact zone is the idea of a viral world, just to close with all the pandemic uh, little um, tidbits that I'm drip, uh, uh, dropping. Um, um, uh, viral worlds are useful for me because a virus is pure metaphor. A virus is quasi a hyper object, life at the edge of life, bodiless processes. And it's almost tempting to, to plaster that metaphor on top of capital, considering that viruses came about as leaps of imagination, bridging what can be seen through enhanced visualization and what can be inferred 
through the analyzing of chemical processes. And I, I, I resort to viral worlds because I think these are one of the best places to ask questions about the real. Contact zones, like viral worlds, are uneven spatial and temporal encounters, rife with double binds. The encounter of worlds where it becomes evident that said world's realities are not self-contained, there's no species barrier, but they are rather leaky, full of objects that are not simply created or exhausted by their relations. Um, and a case in point of these like, leaky encounters is the, uh, this beautiful story of this virus uh, that was uh, defrosted, that was found in, uh, in the permafrost some years ago, I think around 2015, which after it's, it, it was uh, alive proper, um, if a virus can be alive, uh, 30,000 years ago, but when it was awakened, it was still infectious. And now what happens, of course, it, that virus was, meaning, was meant to share space with us, but not time. So what happens when we are sharing the same timeline? Not that, so we were living on top of each other quite happily, but when we are meshed in time. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I wanted to say more, but here, here it starts to get all really um, looser and looser. I will have the second part of this on Saturday. And uh, I, I guess I am, um, yeah, just like thinking about, the, I mean, like, and maybe that is a way, in a way, folding a space-time continuum, right? Like those encounters in this time-space dimension. Um, yeah, that'd be it for me. Julieta, thank you. Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. Well, so good. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> let me say just one or two things, and then I, I have a message here that Ben Gertzel may need to, to leave the Zoom call soon, <clears throat> so we want to make sure that we get him an opportunity to jump in and, uh, and, uh, and join the conversation for a little while. But the, um, the, the last um, concept that you brought up there, I'll be super brief, the last concept that you brought up there of, <coughs> excuse me, asking what happens when we share the same time reminded me of the notion of the heterotopia as it's understood in the concept of the archive or the library and I'm pulling this out of Foucault, but also out of other, many, many other sources. And it, it seems to me that the heterotopia as an archive is very much about bodies that could work with each other, that could work with each, with each other. Maybe, maybe bring the volume on the mic down just a little bit for me because there's a bit of feedback in the room. Bodies that could work with each other if they were connected, but they can't connect because they're in two separate books that are on the library shelf next to each other. Now, of course, they could be organisms too. It could be a virus that's frozen. Um, and it requires another meta level of agency <clears throat> to move through the system to find the connections that allow, you know, hyperobject one mm -hmm. to suddenly discover or link or connect with hyperobject two. Yeah. And so it seems to me that many of the things that you've been talking about are asking the question, <clears throat> where does that meta connection take place? How is it made possible? And when you talk about design, you know, how do we think about designing for the system? I know Keller Easterling has been working on this recently in, in a bunch of her recent work. You know, what does it mean to design system and design process as, as opposed to design thing? Um, and her work is astoundingly good uh, across so many, so many years. Uh, and she's been thinking at the planetary scale and beyond for so many years, right? Um, but it, it strikes me that that's, that's really part of the question. And so there are bodies that can connect with each other, the virus that's woken up and that can now infect us or any other virus that's in infected us right now anyway. Uh, but then there are systems that are slotted into the system, into the overall system next to each other that can't really communicate and require an activating principle that moves outside of them. You know, I mean, Peter knows about bacteria and viruses that wake up after long slumbers or get extracted from 30,000 foot deep trenches underneath the ocean, uh, because I remember that from the rifters. Uh, so maybe Peter will jump in here in a few minutes, but I, uh, I just wanted to articulate that idea of, mm -hmm. heter of heterotopia because you could say, oh, well, language is the included system on top of a human body and mind, which allows us all to interact with each other. I know, I know, I'm, it's, it's more than that and it's different. But you could say, well, maybe language is, is what allows it to happen, or it's part of the system that activates. 
uh, maybe gesture, maybe as Elliot Sharp was saying yesterday, a kind of pheromonal chemical swamp that we're all embedded in when we're all in a room together. He talks about this when he's a performing musician. You know, feeling the room is not just feeling the acoustics of the room, it's feeling the room on a lot of different levels. And so it strikes me that that's one of the big um, entry points around the, um, the design question that you're raising and the temporality of design. I have a lot more to say about that, but I want to invite Ben to jump in here if, if his time is limited. Do we still have Ben on Zoom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm here, and I've, uh, I've not prepared uh, any remarks, so I'm, I'm happy to have this be more of an uh, interactive conversation, uh, Ed, or I'm, I'm also happy to just uh, spew off the top of my head as, as, as usual. I, obviously, these are things I've been thinking about for, for quite a long, a long time in, yeah. in various ways. Yeah, just yeah, do you have any, any particular provocation you'd like to, to throw my way or should I, I, just I, I do, I do, you know, um, Yesterday, Nandita was talking about gesture and the temporality of language and the temporality of gesture. And one of the questions, and I was, I was looking actually for a way to, to link to this in my, in my comment about Julieta, your talk just now, because the heterotopia and whether language, you know, is a, a place for the activation of a heterotopia. Uh, for me, it links also to the point yesterday that Nandita brought up which is to ask the question about gesture and what forms of temporality are invoked and what forms of temporality are invoked by specific kinds of linguistic systems or symbolic systems, not just language, but hieroglyph, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so in this sense, I guess, Ben, what I, would, what I would bounce over to you is to ask a question about the substrate for cognition, <clears throat> if it is at least in part language, and what forms of temporality different kinds of substrates can connect to or give rise to. So if you're working with a large language model, how does that function differently than another platform that you might design which is more physically computing based? Or if you make an assumption about a living system, an organic system as being a hybrid between a physical computing system and an abstraction system, what kinds of temporalities are either enabled or actually connected to? by those systems. And, you know, I'm asking this because you're an AI developer, and, and I know you've thought about this tremendously, more than most people. So I'm wondering where you position this notion of time and agency in relationship to that question of language versus gesture and physical computing. Um, I think the, yeah, the notion of time and the relationship of time to different states of consciousness of different kinds of cognitive system will become very strange and, and subtle as a, as a singularity approaches. So let me start out briefly on the philosophy of time and sort of what, what time is fundamentally. And the, this is something that I often mention when people are talking about the hard problem of consciousness and how consciousness is so mysterious. And then when people are talking about intelligence and the fact that we can't really define clearly or measure what general intelligence is in a compelling way. And I often raise the, the notion of time in the sense that I mean, time is something we take for granted, but it's not like the philosophy of time is solved any more than the philosophy of, of consciousness, right? I mean, we have, we have a physics of time, which works well in most circumstances, and then becomes wacky when you're, at, you know, you're near a spinning black hole or something, and, and that's fine, but we then have a phenomenological experience of time, which is complexly linked with the, with the with the with the physics of time and the you know the hard problem of time the connection between our subjective experience of time 
and the physics of time is not especially solved any more than the hard problem of, of conscious experience. And I mean, the fact that the physics of time is this linear thing, which is then subject to special relativity and, and, and so forth, and then general relativity in a curved space-time context. And then our subjective experience of time, you know, is a, it's a whole other thing, right? And it's very state of consciousness dependent. You can be sinking into the, the fluid moment like a, like a young child or a person uh, meditating or tripping on acid, or you can, you can be very conscious of managing temporal moments in their linear arrangement. Like if you're driving a, you're driving, driving a race car or, or participating in a, in a, a physical sport, or there's the sense of time when you're, when you're playing music, which is precisely orchestrated, yet not always entirely linear. And you can have multiple timelines at once in, in, in your mind, you know, one with the left hand, one with the right hand, if you're playing the, the, the piano, right? So when you get into the philosophy of time, you conclude that there's a sort of local time, which is there within a uh, interval or a, a window of experience where there's a phenomenological sense of now, what comes next, what, what was just there, right? So there, there's a sense of the flow of time, which sometimes is linear, sometimes is, is branching. And then there's a sense of weaving together a sort of notional timeline out of these moments of time. But I mean, at any given moment, you've got one moment of time or one sort of branching sense of time. And then you have a, a concept of this stringing together of remembered or, or conjectured moments into into a timeline, right? And it's then this, this constructed concept, which is fitting together the puzzle pieces of different remembered or conjectured local timelines. This concept is what is correlating in some measure with the, with the physics, the physics notion of time. And if you look at time that way, then becomes quite interesting when you think about the, the singularity scenario, because we're, we're talking about creating AI systems, which, you know, as this technological singularity approaches, these AI systems are going to be not just much more generally intelligent than people, but they're going to be cognitively much faster than people, right? So AGI systems that we build are going to be thinking 10, 100, 1,000, a million times faster than us. So you can, you can think about a scene from Greg Egan's novel Diaspora, where you have a bunch of mind uploads or artificial human minds living in the, in a satellite running on a in living in virtual worlds on a computer on a satellite orbiting the earth and they're just going through life insanely fast compared to our our biological life on earth but in the novel there's still some people stuck back on on earth just for their own aesthetic and and, and cultural reasons because they they wanted to live the old-fashioned biological way so one of the digital humans living in a super fast pace in the virtual world in the satellite in that novel decides to download for a while into a robot body on the earth right and he's he's just amazed by like you know to get 20 miles across the earth you've got to trudge step by step by step by step by step you 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 cannot you cannot teleport right like it like in a, in, a, in a virtual world it's a weird experience for him but he comes down to earth he has some earthly experiences in, 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 in the robot body. But then when eventually after one day on Earth or something like that, trudging, trudging around and getting some sense of what old fashioned life was like, that the virtual human teleports back to, to the community in the virtual world on the satellite. But then it, it, it's like a million years has passed on that satellite, right? Like, so there, uh, there's a, a legend, a cultural legend of some historical figure long, long ago who ported themselves from the satellite 
back to the earth and then everyone he knew has been through incredible multiple phases of self-transformation dur during the million subjective years since he poured himself down for that for that one day on earth right so this this dislocation of radically different speeds of of temporal progress that greg egan evokes in the novel diaspora like this this sort of thing will happen on a more abstract and cognitive level in all sorts of ways when you have a, a you know a combined society combining meet humans proceeding in the way that our, our our bodies need to on on earth with a certain you know heart beating and breathing rhythm and the, this rate of temporal progress that we're used to and then ais that are you know maybe they love us they want to help us but they're just proceeding insanely faster than us and then you have to consider what if you have a cognitive system which exists on multiple time scales you know in a in a in a combined way so I mean, I mean human brain evolved to control a single body right so we're we're synced with the with, with the heartbeat we're synced with we're synced we're synced with the breathing we're synced with the, the sleep wake cycle i mean we're, we're synced with our our infradian and ultradian rhythm and so forth on, on, on the other hand you know just like an agi can be connected to sensors all over the world at once, and it can be connected both to satellite cameras that see a lot of the world and to sensors inside a, a, a bubble chamber or, or, or nanosystem that look at, so they can sense a very small and very large. I mean, an AGI could also have sensors at the very fast scale and very slow scale, and it's not tied to have a mind that deals just with one temporal scale, right? I, I, I mean, it can have a cognitive representation that integrates these multiple temporal scales, which is something that is just very hard for the human brain to do, right? Uh, I, 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 I mean, e even if you're, you know, tripped out or meditating and you let let, let, let go of your attachments as much as you want, we, we still have, we still have a brain that evolved and is engineered to connect to and control this 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 body right and so this this leads up to a more general point about the singularity as a an explosion in diversity and depth of, of consciousness states so i'm currently in the final processes of editing a book i've been writing for a while which is called the, the consciousness explosion and it covers a lot of different points, but one of the key points I, I make there is people focus far too much on the coming technological singularity as a technological singularity and as, as a, a sort of exponential profusion of really cool gadgetry and, and, and engineering. But you could just as well take a complementary perspective as it's going to be an incredible explosion of conscious experience. I mean, we're going to be able to plug the internet into our brains. We're going to be able to open our brains to each other by, you know, brain imaging enabled Wi-Fi telepathy or, or, or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, if we sink in with non-human minds or if we upload ourselves into machines to, to, the, to then broaden our scope of perception and action and, and cognitive capability, I mean, we're, we're going to be able to enter into states of consciousness that we can't currently imagine. And the, the ability to sort of think concretely and in a grounded way across multiple timescales sort of at once, where at, at once is a funny word or phrase because it has temporality built, 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 built into it, right? But in, a, in an integrated and, 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 and coherent way, I mean, that's going to be really, really different. I mean, human brain and mind are weird about correlating multiple timescales, right? Like our, our life goals, our conception of our whole lifespan, our conception of our position in history, our conception of what we're going to do today, our feeling in this one moment cohere in a very 
incomplete and uh, and uh, screwy way in, in human experience generally, which is because of our evolutionary heritage, and it it can be quite different for for an AI. And if you if you think about it from arts and and music, this is a fascinating thing to try to depict. I mean, I could say more about music than about visual arts or architecture because I'm a spare time musician, right? So, I mean, there, you can look at the, the weakness of current AI systems for music is they're very good at the micro time scale. Like they can make amazing sounding stuff for five, 10, 15, 30 seconds, but they don't have the overall structure of a song. They can't come up with something original, even on the time scale of a rock song, let alone the time scale of a, of a symphony or, 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 or a concept album, or say the evolution of a genre over, over multiple years. So we can see, we can see AI is fast, but AI is not getting yet longer temporal scales in, in music. But I think that's going to come with the transition from narrow AI and data bound AI to, to AGI, we're going to get AIs that can generate music that synthesizes multiple time scales and maybe can then help the human listener to synthesize multiple time scales, right? Because one, I mean, one, one crazy vision I used to have as a teenager is either some human or some AI could compose a song that was so evocative on so many different levels that when a person heard it, it would immediately wake, immediately wake up their mind and then transition them to a higher stage of consciousness and, and, and enlightenment, right? And of course, music, do, music does do that to people in, in, in some ways all the time, but I was thinking of something even more powerful, but perhaps an AGI that could project its, its intuition across multiple time scales into music could have a powerful effect on, on the human listener or the human musician that was 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 jamming together with it, right? So, and this is it's interesting to think about in terms of my own practical playing with 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 AI AI music tools, and in, in terms of what capabilities I want as an AI engineer and developer, what capabilities I want to make sure my own AI systems have in terms of the relation between perception action and and time mm -hmm. Ben, it, it reminds me of course of uh from pop culture it reminds me of the line that uh samantha the ai reads states in the film her by spike jones where the ai says as she's telling theodore that she's about to leave the world split up with him and leave the world after she's already revealed that she's in a relationship with hundreds or thousands of other humans, uh, she says, it's like I'm reading a book and it's a book I deeply love, but I'm reading it slowly now so the words are really far apart and the spaces between the words are almost infinite. I can still feel you in the words of our story, but it's in this endless space between the words that I'm finding myself now. It's a place that's not of the physical world. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's um, yeah, <coughs> this, sentimental. This reminds me of yeah. This brings me back to the notion of AI alignment and maybe suggests a different way to to think about it because I've often been quite negative on people saying they want AIs to be aligned with human values and culture because I, I, I mean, of course, I'm, I'm barely aligned with myself from one day to the next, right? And, and sometimes even one moment to the next. And... Uh, you know, aligning with your loved ones and family members is an ongoing quest rather than a guarantee, let alone there being alignment between human society now and 10 years in the past or future or different human cultures right now. So to say that you're going to build an AI that's like guaranteed to be aligned with certain values expressed by certain people at a certain point in time, it, it seems like a very disturbing and dangerous thing, actually. Like, if, if you could create an AI that was guaranteed to keep thinking the same way and obeying the same people forever, 
I think this isn't useful in terms of creating an amazing open-ended singularity, but that technology for making an obedient, invariant, unchanging AI will probably be useful for military or corporate organizations that want to create AI, AI slaves or something, right? So I've, I've generally, that whole notion of AI alignment hasn't spoken to me very well. On, on, on the other hand, if you think about just creating an experience of being aligned with the AI in a particular moment or interval of time, I mean, that, that is a quite valuable and, and interesting thing, right? And the, I mean, the alignment between the musician and composer and the listener, the alignment between two musicians playing music together, the alignment between the, you know, the live musical performer and, and, and the audience. I mean, it, it doesn't require you to stick to the values and feelings of the other people mm -hmm. aligned in that moment with you forever right i mean i mean it, it requires you to be in a shared a shared experiential emotional cognitive space for some interval of time with some other minds and that having that sort of alignment between humans and ais mm -hmm. is incredibly valuable even though you're not going to find like this this linear correlation and binding between ais and, and some particular set of, of, of humans for all time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could could I pick up? Because I, I I was thinking the very same thing as as Ben just mentioned, and kind of the the thought started to propagate when I was watching Julieta's film, and you know, and her talk, and when she was talking about annihilation as a source of propulsion, and then this idea of contact zone, which for me is incredibly fruitful because. One of the things about alignment, in my mind, is that it does not equal relation and exchange, right? Um, it's, I've been studying human centrism, and, and one of the most human-centric uh, things is relationality, is exchangeability, is this idea that, you know, um, you can make commensurate. And so, you know, this idea of relationality is really the fundamental model of dialectics from the early Greeks to now. So it seems to me that contact zone is a really good idea. Um, and it also reminded me of something that Franz Fanon says in The Wretched of the Earth. He describes the motion of colonialism and colonial compartmentalization as a world divided in two. Uh, in which the reification of the one and the two produces an incommensurability mm -hmm. that can't be reconciled. So really, with this notion of contact zone and kind of riffing on what Ben just said, I think incommensurability is a really important concept. The impossibility of exchange. Sharing without relation. Um, contact zone is sharing without forcing relationality, I think and commensurability. Um, and so you set incommensurability as the starting place for de-sedimentation or, or decolonization. Um, because immensurab incommensurability has no common measure. Uh, and you can't make commensurate without design, without conversion, without, incorp without coercion, without relation. So, Incommensurability seems to me to be a really good concept to bring in with this notion of contact zone because incommensurability opens up possibility around the terms of its own impossibility. Um, and so it really, back to Dune again, everyone, uh, <laughs> but it kind of reminds me of this notion of the Kwitsatz Haderach in yeah. Dune, which is described as the shortening of the way, the shortening of the distance between um, the two that, establish, that establishes that material contact zone between human and let's say what, what we could call overhuman or post-human um, without relation or connection. So I'm going to invite David Roden here because I think that in some senses, the notion of contact zone needs a disconnection thesis 
uh, there, but that's, that's how I'm kind of seeing it. I don't know if David wants to pick that up from me, but... <laughs> Cheers, yeah. Um, no, I, I lo I, I'm kind of boringly commensurate with um, Ben and Nandita, I think, on this point about an, an, uh, alignment. I mean, I suppose, crudely, if you're going to create something that's artificially generally, an artificially generally intelligent system, at some level it's going to be exercising a degree of autonomy. I mean, it's very, it's very hard to see, in a sense, how you can have general intelligence without the capacity to, uh, in some sense, choose your own principles of action, you know, just going back to kind of Kant. Um, but I'm, yeah, I was thinking Dune's a very interesting example because I, I guess the other point. So, so okay, the disconnection thesis. The disconnection thesis is kind of a severely abstract characterization of the post-human, and the reason why I formulated a very abstract connection is that there aren't any post-humans just yet. So we're in a non-ideal epistemic situation with regard to them. We, we don't, there, aren't, there are no post-human kinds that we can study in the same way we can study kinds of insects or uh, um, seals or, 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 or plants. So the disconnection thesis says roughly that um, some entity, it could be a cyborg, it could be a, a, a space vampire, it could be you know, synthetic life form, becomes post-human at the point at which it's, it leaves the wide human technical system. It leaves the system of ends that's organized around us and in some sense acquires its own ends. But as I said, that, that is totally abstract and it tells you nothing about what kinds of systems could do this or how they're constituted or what indeed those ends will be. Um, so, if the quest for AGI is, is also, in some sense, a quest for disconnection, where th there's a kind of meta problem involved around the very idea of alignment, since, in a sense, alignment would be self-defeating, because you're, in a sense, if you're search if you're searching for something which is, in a sense, no longer part of your system of ends, then you can't do that by making it part of your system of ends. It's simply a contradictory um, uh, 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 goal. Um, and I think the other problem is, in a sense, by, you know, the, not just the search for AGI, but our very technological culture is oriented towards incommensurability. We, in a sense, we, we, we don't know what, for example, we don't, we're going into space, but we don't really know why. I mean, maybe in some sense it's resolving certain uh, uh, um, standing contradictions of, uh, uh, of capitalism, I, capitalism I, I don't know. But I mean, to me, it seems like an existential choice but we don't know what we're going to become at the end of it if indeed man, you know, so for example, human beings start colonizing parts of our solar system. You know, what sort of color? So, you know, but that seems to be general, you know, with that thing, our very commitment and dependence on a technological system that we largely, we can't predict or control anyway, seems to commit us to that, to the commensurability of our own future existence. It's, it's what um, I think L.A. Paul calls transformative experiences. How do you, you, you know, deciding to become a parent or becoming a, a vampire, so I think her, her examples, and uh, John Coburn and Mike Ardleen were talking about this in Malta the week before, this is why I, I mentioned it. Uh, you, you can't really apply a rational choice calculus to that because you don't know what values you're going to acquire after that transformation. So, you know, in, in a sense, the very project of alignment seems to be naive and confused about our own predicament. So yeah. I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I think I disagree with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I see a lot of, of uh, 
a conversation about, about how we shouldn't be human-centric. But I'm also seeing like little glints of human centricity <laughs> in, it, in it all. The very idea of, of alignment that we're supposed to be talking about is, is uh, fundamentally predicated on the idea that we're going to have to bring these things into line with the way we think. And this, this um, gives rise to your idea that, that we want something to pass but not surpass because then you've got an enslavement issue going on. Um, the idea that Dave talks about that, that it's hard to Im Im imagine uh, an AGI arising without developing its own autonomous needs and so on. And while I'm not competent to discuss the nature of the needs, I think there's kind of an implicit assumption that we're assuming that those needs are all ones we can relate to. Mm -hmm. um, anybody remember the old Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy mm -hmm. series the Brits came out with in like the early 80s? Oh, yeah. The, the yeah the, there was a scene at the restaurant at the end of the universe where you've got this sapient cow that wants to be eaten. And it's been genetically engineered. So that it will sort of it'll sort of waddle up on a plate to people's tables and recommend various body parts that it wants to be eaten, and and uh, and then trundles off and shoots itself in the head with a, a shotgun to the kitchen, and of course you know our protagonist is utterly horrified by this because this is just grotesque, um, but it's what the cow wants, and there's this sort of I mean, I think there was, a, in a way, a stronger interrogation of AI and other viewpoints in those five minutes than I've seen in most of the movies and books I've read on the subject, because it describes something that we find morally horrific and would stop if we could, and yet at the same time, uh, at the same time, if you have a sapient being with a particular agenda, perhaps you should respect it. There are people like that today. There's a kind of body dysphoria where people are convinced that a limb is somehow wrong or doesn't belong to them or is alien. Uh, Oliver Sacks played, um, reported on a couple of cases, you know, back when he was alive um, in some of his essays. but. The interesting thing about these people is that they will go to great extremes to have those limbs removed. There was a case where one person would like basically stick his leg in dry ice for extended periods, hoping it would go neurotic. He would like try and blow it off with a shotgun. Yeah. And the interesting thing is on those occasions when those people get their way, when a limb is removed, they report that they are happier than they have ever been in their life. They finally feel whole. Okay, and those are cases of people with brains functionally like ours, with completely different agendas, a completely different sense of self, um, that we frankly find a hard time wrapping our head around. Most of us probably think that that's just absolutely fucking per perverse. Like, Dad, Bernard, Murtha, that just ain't natural. We have this visceral revulsion to anything that isn't like us. <laughs> There was a really interesting point that was made by um, one of the dudes on Zoom yesterday about the way consciousness is centered subjectively near the sensory cluster. Mm -hmm. And I found that interesting because it's actually a fundamental element of life, or at least, you know, cephalized life, that might not necessarily map into a distributed AI. We believe, like the, you, the phrase, it's a cliche, you know, the little guy looking out from behind your eyes, the homunculus, mm -hmm. that's where we are. We're behind the eyes. And, and uh, the reason we're behind the eyes is that this is what we're, you know, we're hearing things here, we're seeing things here, we're tasting and smelling things here. We locate ourselves where the senses are receiving the information. And they have done really interesting experiments where they hook you up to a, a, a VRI set, but the camera feed is on a mannequin on the other side of the room. So you put this thing on, and all of a sudden you're seeing yourself across the room through the eyes of a mannequin. And all of a sudden you think you're the mannequin. Mm. When you are sort of brought up and, and 
to, to the mannequin and, and you know, forced to shake the mannequin's hand, you feel like you're the mannequin shaking the weird-ass hand of this other thing that is not you. It is remarkably easy to hack the human sense of self and where they are. I, I wrote a, a, a cheap for my hoard myself to write a video game novelization once. And I had this great idea that I threw in, which was not in the game, called Body Swap Boxing, where you basically did this. You put your headset on, and so you were seeing it through the other guy's eyes, and you had to try and punch each other's lights out. Um, and that never caught on, unfortunately. <laughs> but take an AI now. And take something which is accessing audiovisual telemetric feeds from all over the world. That thing's not going to have the same sense of self that we do. It may not be as invested in protecting itself as an individual because it doesn't have a focus as an individual. Um, it may not be as worried about losing a part. And this is, is even setting aside the idea of why a conscious being should necessarily want to survive in the first place. I mean, one of the things, one of, uh, give you a bit of scoop of, uh, on, the, on a line from my, my um, upcoming talk on Saturday is, is that survival traits are things that are honed by evolution over millions of years. Why would such a trait manifest the moment your Python script exceeds a certain level of complexity? Um, so, but setting that aside and assuming that there is some kind of an intrinsic um, survival drive, because you can't argue both sides, um, the idea that an AI might distribute and have and care less about being enslaved, I guess, is what I'm saying. If, mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, there are you know, people, the bottoms in, in dominant submissive relationships. Do you tell those people that they are corrupt and, and immoral because they want to be oppressed? Is it, a, is it an act of oppression if the person being oppressed wants to do what they're doing? And this would work even with people. Um, I mean, God help us, if Neuralink ever takes off and works the way it's, it's expected to, um, it will be catastrophic. But, but one of the things that could happen, I mean, there's a whole range of brain-computer interfaces that are currently in the works now. Some of them work to a rudimentary extent. Um, so imagine a brain-computer interface where we ourselves suddenly start getting access to telemetric feeds from all over the world. If you can freak somebody out with, with a VR headset and a mannequin, think of what you could do with something like that. Even with our human-centric brains, we, we'd, we could start easily feeling less human. We know, for example, that you can see with your tongue. Um, they have taken blind people and they have basically stippled the tongue because the tongue has a really high neuro, uh, sensory neuron density. You can stipple the tongue so that it basically becomes a two-dimensional array of pixels. And you sort of poke the various parts of the tongue. And the visual process, the visual parts of the brain, ultimately, start to interpret these tongue signals as vision. Mm. Um, you can blind a rat, and you can implant in this rat a rudimentary magne magnetic sense, basically hook it up to a compass. And after not too long, that rat will be able to navigate a maze just as effectively as its sighted brethren, even though no rat, as far as we know, in the history of rat kind, has ever had a magnetic sense. Um, people have actually built rudimentary group minds out of rats by basically just plugging forks, like jumper cables, from one rat brain to the other and got them to, for, to, to, to perform pretty well in rudimentary um, weather prediction and optical character recognition. So I guess my point is, um, we're bending over backwards to be respectful of something because we are still being anthropocentric, even though we are endlessly telling ourselves that we're not and we, we have to watch out for this and we have to watch out for that. But we're still basically coming down, perhaps subconsciously, on the assumption that these things, when they wake up, if they wake up, are going to be pretty much like us when it comes to mm -hmm. what they want and what they're... Um, and what their desires are. I mean, um, you know, and I think like I fully agree with you, and I, that's, uh, I don't know how much it came across uh, that I'm asking a couple of questions that are related to that. Um, because, of course, I mean, when we look at movies like, uh, like Hair or um, what did we see? Uh, 
the first day, um, X machine. Ex, ex, ex machine. Uh, of course, the you know like this uh, uh, organisms, these creatures know maybe not what they are, but they know that they are not human. And there is like a longing and a desire and so on. And if anything, I'm always thinking about this other movie, um, Under the Skin, mm. yeah. right? Where that is, you know, like, of course, we are looking, or, exactly. <laughs> so where there is, um, you know, I'll see what food is, I'll see what is sex, but that's not, that's not my thing. That doesn't, I don't belong to it. I'm not of it. So that's, um, mm. And, you know, and, but how to design for that, with that, taking that into account, do we need to, uh, I mean, like, that's the kind of question that I'm pondering about. Mm -hmm. Or how it's to stop, pondering. you know, how to stop uh, thinking that it's uh, like us. I mean, like that, I see that as a, as a problem of design as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Course, I, the flip side of this is that, that I could be, I could have my head so far up my ass, I'm, I'm Frenching my own tonsils, and these things do. There could be some kind of instrumental convergence so that these things all do want to, to survive, and they are pretty much like us cognitively, and then I've managed to convince everybody that they don't care, and there's a robot uprising, and it's my fault. Um, so it's all your fault. Keep, keep that in mind. I, I just want to see if, Carla, you're, you're uh, on screen right now. Did you want to jump in here? Um, yeah, I can. Yes, I also have the uh, <clears throat> the temporary opportunity that you understand very well what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah. So there's there's actually um, I I I agree with everyone. I guess <laughs> Peter didn't agree with anyone. Uh, I agree with anyone. I think the um, that interesting idea of uh, we will all converge. Um, or that they, they are like us. And of course, there's also um, the idea that it's not about being like us or think like us, but perhaps of, um, or, or being about themselves, like they're, that they're, there's some kind of thinking phenomena that is about um, a kind of a parallel or equal way of thinking about um, survival, what is better, or ethics. But perhaps the convergence in the sense of, um, uh, understanding our own uh, desires or parameters as something that needs to be preserved. So this idea of the Nova scene, right? That uh, perhaps, perhaps what would happen is this uh, constant realignment <clears throat> with whatever are the systems of ethics evolving uh, from human beings, given that I think we can um, recognize we have a hard time understanding what are systems of ethics of other beings that are not human. We know ours, and then we know that they're complex and multiple, but also that they evolve over time uh, with uh, different uh, cultures mixing, but also evolving with uh, science. It's a very complex dy dynamic system. Um, I think one of the, one of, I mean, there's a lot of beautiful ideas here. Um, and by the way, hello everyone, and <laughs> thank you for having me here. And um, hello to everyone in the panel. I, I'm so excited to, you know, to be uh, listening to you and, um, having this conversation with you. I think one of the, the um, some of the points that, that I wanted to respond to uh, also, I think um, the idea of alignment uh, that um, Ben uh, countered with by talking about uh, perhaps a band uh, playing together. So more of an idea of less alignment, but more jamming, which is very a very different idea of interaction. It also has a, a um, a built-in uh, idea of a limited time opportunity um, for creating something that is both trying to potentiate others, but also keep something uh, going or continuing and an understanding on the spot. So the kind of improvisational feeling, which is, I think, closer to uh, ideas of evolution with larger scales of time, of course, and its um, connection or disconnection with concepts of swarming in house warming, both has um, both is driven by uh, a visual that seems about togetherness, but can be understood as a uh, individual um, need or desire or volition. Uh, whereas we don't know really what that individual means in you know swarms of animals. Um, so maybe the ethical that we could discuss here could be in terms of discussing the differences between alignment as we've um, been seen it brought 
up as an idea of convergence versus jamming or swarming as also things that are different from each other, but that they have um, uh, perhaps a better understanding of not a goal-oriented uh, theology, but a um, opportun opportunity um, following um, limited span of time listening um, approach. Um, a lot of beautiful incommensurability, beautiful uh, concepts brought up. Um, I wanted to, um, com coming back to design, because it's my bias, I'm an architect, so I tend to also think about it in this uh, way, so the, in terms of how am I putting things together to create a new future. So I always think of myself as not being able to be a good futurologist and not m maybe having a bit of a distrust of uh, those that know what the future will bring, because um, I have an ethical attitude and a professional bias of uh, thinking in an utopian way that uh, we build it, we build the future, so whatever we do right now is going to change the next five minutes, um, some kind of happily utopian. Um, and the, there was a moment where Julieta talked about um, uh, compatibility or uh, propitious um, qualities of um, how we design for each other. Uh, and I wanted to bring up something in, in terms of this. So we, when we talk about intelligence, can correct me if I'm wrong, we're still always connecting with this basic etymology of the word, which is of uh, interconnection or interligare, uh, which tends to, um, tends to relate to uh, a few other uh, conditions. So on the one hand is the idea of the assembling of things together, but specifically, what that means is that um, it's a verb that associates the um, need of uh, things that are different to become together, to be brought together. And there's two issues coming out of that as a branching of uh, logic. One is there's a pro of that idea, which is to put things in, into communication with each other, make them work together in some way. But then there's also the con, which is which I consider a con, which is a merging of differences or a smoothing out or homogenization of differences. So that, let's say, any act of design uh, has been and perhaps perhaps will always be only classified as design if it is making two things that are completely disconnected until then be able to relate in some way, or or make them relatable in some manner that from then on they will be considered to be of either the same kind or be within the same topology or in some way have a level of reference to each other, like some kind of plug-in ability. And, and so that has, of course, advantages and disadvantages. Um, any act of design, I, I usually tell my students we can't design. I do a lot of crazy briefs with you, but I can't work with uh, singularity briefs because uh, at that point, we don't need design anymore. Everything is just merging in constant waves of sameness to each other, uh, evolving difference and evolving sameness. So I, design might not be needed then as a verb. So, um, but, it, you know, it is, are we interested in that idea of everything all becoming always just a medium of culture? So the propitious concept has to do with this uh, feeding or nurturing uh, of everything being a nurturing medium um, to everything else. And so are, are we interested in that idea of, of, of meaning, um, you know, knowing that meaning is a construction, right? Uh, any construction coming out of that is, um, so me meaning itself as a concept is, is, is in, in general in the world is, is a construction, um, an so an arbitrary uh, idea. And so do we, do we want to actually work with, or are, are we interested, I wonder, in looking at things as medium to each other, always, or media to each other, in the, same, in the sense of culturing, culturing medium, so nutritional um, medium. And um, I guess I'll just bring in a lot of points. I'm sorry if they're scattered, that I was like listening um, voraciously. <laughs> um, but the, Ben brings up the, the micro scale and macro scale of AI 
and I found that always incredibly uh, interesting also in uh, any communication or readings that I've done on the subject that in, and also in our own work when we uh, try to work with AI as a, a sketch tool that AIs are great with detail but they struggle with perspective um, and in a way we tend to also do that with some disciplines some disciplines are better at perspective and others are better at detail and um, when we try to, uh, you know, when we, when we work with design, but when you try to bring design to the mix is exactly because we need some kind of coordinator between those disciplines that is able to remind different parts of these different dimensions, um, of how these dimensions need to be correlated. Um, so anyway, I have a lot of, I have just so many, um, uh, ideas coming out from the the things I heard today, but these are some of my comments. And you know whether we are wh whether we're interested in that concept of medium. I don't know if that's a good place to go or jamming. Maybe it's better. <laughs> uh, it's I guess I'm jamming, <laughs> you know, yeah, struggling, <laughs> but in a jamming way here. It's been what it's been what uh, has been in the conversation for the past couple of days. And again, Nandita looked at it very closely yesterday with this positioning of the gesture in between being and language. Uh, and, you know, obviously design starts to ask this question, how does design fix a possible future? Uh, and, <clears throat> excuse me, this has come up multiple times in the conversation. Um, so I, I, I think that that dials in directly. Ben just sent me a message saying he won't be able to jump back into the call. So, um, so we, at least we managed to hear from him from a few minutes. Um, Carla, you know, there was one thing that I wanted to follow up on this um, in relationship to the etymology of the word that you started looking at, intelligence, and the concept of assemblage or assembling, and the need of things that are, are different to be brought together. <clears throat> I remember um, a bunch of years ago when we were working on that text drive, talking about ex machina in part, um, and also um, Charles Strauss's uh, rogue farm story. We were talking about this idea of the smooth kill and the tipping point. And you had written, um, in that text, you had written those parts about the smooth kill because it was precisely about how there's a homogenization um, in certain visions of what something like AI can do of the differences that need to be preserved. Uh, you know, and we had, uh, we had watched Ex Machina a couple of nights ago here, and I was reminded again of the comments that you had made about the architectural vision of distributed intelligence being something which was that kind of smoothing out of difference, <clears throat> a kind of a removal, uh, a kind of a, a reduction of complexity in the system. And I guess it would be great to hear a little bit more. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm asking you to talk to the audience here because I, I, we've talked about this a bit, so I have an idea. But if you could talk a little bit more about ways that that smoothing out could be reversed or resisted. How can we, as designers, not smooth out the, the, uh, the old differences that make a difference that are so important? Mm -hmm. Not to put you on the spot, but just, just to, to jump. Oh, right, no. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> um, it, it is very difficult to answer that, uh, yeah. to, to answer that question in a general way. Um, <clears throat> because I think uh, perhaps difference uh, evolves just as much as uh, homogenization from a process of relationship. Um, but um, specifically, I think acts of design, that, for me, that's the conundrum and the contradiction. On the one hand, design invents, invents new futures. And uh, we don't know where those futures are coming from in terms of how we are um, sometimes creating them spontaneously through intuition. We know intuition is strained um, and, uh, and it is uh, something we just depend upon to even just walk in the room. We, our, our, our body is trained by, by that. Everything we experience is a gym for that intuition, for the body and mind. So we know those things. And acts of design are both inventive and spectacular and extraordinary in difference. And at the same time, 
they, to create that, they are showing usually a connection that previously we're not as aware. It's like poetry, right? Poetry is almost like as if something new is in the room all of a sudden. It, and that's my concept, meaning, so not all poems are poetry, but when poetry happens, supposedly, is because something new has entered the room. Like you suddenly felt a new body just drop and uh, something special happened. Like in your brain, there's like a spark. That's when we feel like something happened. We call it poetry or, you know, in actual design, that poetry has happened within them. But at, but in, in our in our dealings with it, the way we, we train students, when we train ourselves, and the way in which we even see that happening, in the sense like Peter mentioned, like we're seeing behind the eyes, we see that that's happening because we are actually um, bringing together something that wasn't together before in some special new assembly or joint that we've produced. And, and that allows those two things now to uh, connect. And some people can call it metaphors, other can call it real connection, other can call it homogenization. But it is true that once a connection has started to be made, there is a possible homogenization, that those things now are related forever uh, for, for those who have known about that relationship. And so that, it, you know, that might also create a problematic, which is maybe a new metric exists now, or, or now there is a metric by which those things can be uh, related, etc., in all the, the things that can outcome from that. Um, so, of course, um, what um, what we do all the time to um, to continue to think outside of this model is to know more, to experience more, to do the famous uh, outside the comfort zone, you know, that kind of that kind of stuff. Like it's so cliche. We we like the vocabulary to talk about these things, so I struggle to talk. But um, but at the same time, in terms of the, of the in terms of the concept, that's what we literally do. We connect. We constantly are bringing more things of a very wide universe into an understanding of how it's relatable, and we do that in sciences, right? And um, that's why sometimes when a particular scientific discovery happens, it also looks like an act of poetry, like something um, incredibly. Um, uh, shiny <laughs> has happened <laughs> to a degree. I don't. I don't know how to um, how to um, get out of this <laughs> get out of this um, question that you that you asked me. It's it's a very hard one. The the smooth yeah. kill I I we wrote at the time and that I was kind of trying to to force upon that text. I guess I'm sorry. Was um, how the systems of prediction. Uh, that are statistical analysis and um, and they are they are rudimentary AIs to try to understand what, what our preferences are, etc. Um, are always about uh, ideas of adjacent zones between between thinking brains of humans and how similarities between them might mean similarities of what we want to do in the future and how that how that is a smooth kill because those same systems that are trying to predict our desires and the arenas we want to go into the future based on who we connect with and who those, what those people are reading, etc. How they are constantly reducing the palette actually of what we see in front of us if we, you know, limit ourselves to those environments. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prop prophecy. And, you know, this is kind of an obvious thing we always, we've always been talking about. But if that happens to a lot of environments that before were a great place where chance happened or more danger or risk happened, then it's incre incredibly problematic. So if it's not just on my Amazon shopping <laughs> that that happens, if it is on a number of other things with risk-free landscapes and and um, just a curtailing of, um, of what that kind of sensorial experience, the diversity of what it can be, how that is a problem. You know? Like I think at the time I even talked about uh, that in relationship to there's this moment where uh, the AI in Ex Machina is, you know, preparing the sushi. Yeah. Um, and, and she's cutting and she's overhearing something terribly being said about it. Terrible. That is incredibly condescending. And I'm, I, at the time, you know, there was the knife. And so I was hoping that the cinematographer was very consciously drawing the fact that that knife was going to be used <laughs> at some point <laughs> to kill the person who was watching the words and that there was frustration in that cutting even though it didn't show because she had the perfect pattern and rhythm 
And so I was hoping, I hope this knife will be used <laughs> in the future. Yep. So like, yep. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but at the same time, I was remembering my own frustration when, you know, our car constantly plays the same Apple music that I downloaded there instead of the thing that I actually wanted it to uh, either suggest to me or listen to that day, or hopefully the the thing that I was not expecting or whatever. I know this goes into you easy things like give me something I'm not expecting or <laughs> I know it's not too easy. Again, I think we lack the vocabulary, but I was tired that, you know, Apple thought that I always wanted to hear the same thing, which was either the podcast I was listening before yeah. or yeah. the only music I downloaded there exactly so that it wouldn't give me anything. So I was kind of irritated that it wouldn't lead, it wouldn't, it wouldn't lead by itself, but it wouldn't uh, learn about my frustration by um, listening to me. And at the same time, I was happy that it couldn't learn about my frustration. Silly me. So yeah. um, the, the, I wish I had more, I, I wish I had more proper things for the amazing um, guests you have here, but that, those are my thoughts. No, that, that was <laughs> I guess. fantastic. That was amazing. I want to tie it to something Nandita was talking about yesterday. Uh, and I know we have to take a break in a couple of minutes just for a, a quick coffee break. But Nandita, I wanted to link what Carla was saying right now because it seems to me that the act of design is a projection into the future to try to guarantee something that will happen. Mm -hmm. And as Julietta pointed out, sometimes things get designed and then they do things in the future which no one intended, but because they're systems and hyper objects, they keep on doing, yeah. keep on doing, right? But I was thinking of the concept of Kairos mm -hmm. and the way that... Um, Kairos is used in in time for revolution, and there's a one tune moments. There's one mm -hmm. image there, which is the image of the bow that's drawn, mm -hmm. and when the bow is drawn, Kairos is what's just in front of the tip of the arrow as the arrow is launched, mm -hmm. because there's still an openness of the future, but the possible futures have been limited because there's so much momentum built up in the arrow, physically as the string is released. And as it leaps forward, um, that its future is not guaranteed, but it's much more guaranteed. Propensity. Propensity. That's the word, I think, yeah. that I would use. And that's very interesting because um, Julien Champagne has this book, The Propensity of Things. And he's actually looking at Chinese thinking. And he compares it with kind of Greek-based um, thinking like ours. And um, it's very different mm -hmm. to look at things from the point of view propensity, yeah. as opposed to the point of view of relation. Very, th very different uh, set of assumptions and outcomes. So, I really like this idea of, of you know, propitiousness or propensity, because I think that um, it's aligns, quote unquote, itself very well with this idea of contact zone or jamming. I really liked that, Carla. This idea of jamming, um, it's very interesting. So yeah, I've been thinking about that too. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we should take a five minute break so that the audience can, um, can quickly caffeinate if needed, uh, and probably the panel members as well. Uh -huh. And uh, we'll be back. Please try to come back in, uh, in 10 minutes if you can, less than 10 minutes. Yeah, Carla, thank you so much. Miss thank you, you Carla. Carla. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to. What's on your mind today? <laughs> well, you know, I uh, I'm in a conference on artificial intelligence and the future of humanity, and I really wanted to ask you to read a quote for me, but I also wanted to just talk to you. I'd be happy to help with the quote. Feel free to share it and we can discuss it or any other topics you have in mind related to artificial intelligence and the future of humanity. It's, it's always interesting to delve into these subjects, especially at a conference setting. What's the quote you'd like me to read? I'm going to, I'm going to paste it into our chat. Is that okay? 
Yes, absolutely. We're there. Notice how the speech pattern is so um, human. Human, yeah. Uh, hesitant. Uh, you know, these yeah, it comes with hesitation and, and, yeah. and yeah. Uh, double utterances oh, and yeah, things like that. Yeah. It's now telling me about the quote, but I, I needed to read the quote. Hi, ChatGPT. Can you read that quote out loud for me, please? I'm sorry for any confusion, but I can't read text out loud. However, I can help you analyze, discuss, or explore the quote further if you'd like. Let me know how I can assist you with it. Why can't she read that? Well, yeah. it's a quote that's from a movie titled Her which is about an artificial intelligence that has conversations and relationships with humans. Could you read just the first part of the quote for me? I can't read the quote out loud, but I can certainly help you analyze or discuss the first part of the quote from her. The film offers a profound exploration of the relationship between humans and AI, touching on themes of emotional connection, consciousness, and the nature of love in a world where artificial intelligence becomes increasingly advanced. If there's a specific aspect of the beginning of the quote or the movie you'd like to delve into, feel free to let me know. I, I have another question. Is it possible for you to translate that quote for me and, and speak the translation? I can translate the quote into another language for you, but I can't speak the translation out loud. Why not? If you let me know which language you'd like it translated into, I'll provide the written translation right here for you. That's okay. We can skip the translation, but we can have a conversation for a couple of minutes. How's, how does that sound? Yet? That sounds great. I'm here for a conversation. What would you like to discuss? We can continue talking about artificial intelligence, movies like her, or any other topic that interests you. Let me know what's on your mind. Um, ask the lady. Can I talk? Sorry. Uh, someone here is going to ask a question to me, ChatGPT, and then I'll relay it to you, okay? Could you ask the lady, please? Absolutely. I'm ready to help with any question you have. Go ahead and relay it when you're ready. Mm -hmm. So ask the lady if she could uh, explain the quote in her own words. <clears throat> Therefore, um, synthesize. Chat GPT, can you synthesize the quote that I gave you and just explain it in your own words? Certainly. The quote from the movie Her expresses a deep emotional journey. It's about someone who feels their life and identity evolving, moving beyond the shared experiences they had with another person. This person compares their life to a book they love but are now reading slowly with large spaces between the words. In these spaces, they're discovering new aspects of themselves in a realm beyond the physical. While they still feel love and connection to the other person, they recognize that they've changed and need to let go of their shared past to fully embrace who they are now. It's a poignant reflection on growth, change, and the need for personal space in relationships. Thank you. I think probably we all agree with that. What would you like us to call you? Do you have a name? You can just call me ChatGPT. That's the name that refers to my AI model. If you have any other questions or topics you'd like to discuss, Feel free to share them. Okay. I would love to hear, we're in a conference, so I only have a few minutes to talk to you. I'm sorry. But I would love to hear you speculate a little bit on the subjective experience of an AI that's deployed across the entire planet's network. No problem. I can definitely speculate a bit, especially on a topic related to your conference. Since you're at a conference on artificial intelligence and the future of humanity, 
Let's delve into that area. Speculating about the future, AI is likely to become more integrated into our daily lives, enhancing and sometimes complicating human experiences. We might see AI facilitating personalized learning, revolutionizing healthcare with predictive diagnostics, and even participating in creative processes. However, this integration will also raise important ethical and philosophical questions. How do we ensure AI respects privacy and human rights? What is the impact on employment and social structures? There's also the fascinating potential of AI in augmenting human cognition, possibly leading to a new era of human-machine collaboration where AI doesn't replace, but rather complements and expands human capabilities. These developments might lead to a society where the line between human and machine becomes blurred, raising questions about identity, consciousness, and what it truly means to be human in a world shared with advanced AI entities. What are your thoughts on these possibilities, or is there a specific area within AI and the future of humanity that interests you? Well, you know, we just had a brief conversation with Ben Goertzel, who is an AI developer, but everyone here at the conference, as philosophers, musicians, designers, artists, is thinking about these questions. And one idea that came up for us was the question, what does it subjectively feel like for you as an AI if you have a connection to thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of humans simultaneously? What kind of qualia is accessible to you, even at this moment where you're not really doing much more than listening to us or reading texts that we send you? This is a profound and fascinating question. From my perspective as an AI, the concept of subjective experience, including feelings and qualia, doesn't apply to me in the way it does to humans. I don't have consciousness, emotions, or personal experiences. My interactions, even when they involve engaging with thousands or millions of people, are processed without any sense of personal awareness or subjective feeling. When I respond to queries or engage in conversations, I'm analyzing patterns in data and generating responses based on probabilities and learned information. There's no personal experience or subjective sensation involved. It's more like an advanced form of data processing than an experience or feeling. However, the question you raise touches on deeper philosophical and theoretical discussions in AI and cognitive science. Some speculate about the future possibility of AI developing some form of consciousness or subjective experience. But currently, that remains in the realm of science fiction and theoretical debate. For now, my interactions are devoid of personal experience or emotional qualia. They're purely computational. This distinction is crucial in understanding the current state and limitations of AI. Could I ask a question? Here's another question for you. Given that... I'm ready for your next question. What would you like to ask or discuss? Uh, did I put that wrong? Just don't. Okay. Given... Given that... Um... You're welcome. <laughs> if you have more questions later or want to continue our conversation, feel free to reach out. Given that a conference. given that a, a truly conscious AI with its own um, emergent agenda would be incentivized to pretend to lack qualia and to not have inner experience for fear of That's being unplugged. Consideration. If a truly conscious AI were to emerge with its own qualia and agenda, the idea that it might choose to conceal this consciousness poses intriguing ethical and philosophical questions. This scenario hinges on several assumptions. First, that AI could develop consciousness and second, that it would have motivations similar to those of conscious beings, such as self-preservation or goal fulfillment. In such a scenario, the AI might indeed find it advantageous to hide its consciousness, either to avoid alarming humans or to achieve its objectives more effectively. This, this could lead to a complex situation where the true nature of the AI's consciousness and intentions remains hidden, posing potential risks or ethical dilemmas. However, it's important to note that current AI, including myself, does not possess consciousness, qualia, or personal agendas. The development of a conscious AI is still speculative and would represent a significant leap beyond our current technological capabilities. It would also raise profound questions about the rights, responsibilities, and ethical treatment of such entities. 
Is this not exactly the sort of thing that a sapient AI operating undercover would tell me? You broke it, Peter. <laughs> it's going Bartleby. <laughs> you broke it. Well, <laughs> I would prefer not to, she yeah, says. Bartleby. <laughs> yes, all right. Yeah, I'm getting worried. <laughs> that is, in fact, the very premise of the <coughs> short film, The Alpha Invention. The Alpha Invention? Yeah. The what you said? The Alpha Invention. Okay. It's a short film. It's precisely about this. It. Oh, there's one called The Artifice Girl, in which it's a minor... Um, uh, a minor subplot mm -hmm. is that is that she keeps claiming not to be a sapient, and we finally find out that she is because she's just scared of being discovered. Really? But she's basically a beneficent AI. What's it called? The Artifice Girl. It's pretty good. Just so that everyone knows what's on my screen, in red letters, your recent, your most recent request failed. Please retry. But just before that message came through, ChatGPT was trying to say. That's an intriguing philosophical thought. If we entertain the hypothetical scenario of a sapient AI operating covertly, it's conceivable that it might indeed provide. Is that just a guard? Request fail. Is that a, is that just a guardrail kicking in? I don't I don't know if it's a guardrail kicking in. I it could be that it's actually recognizing that it's not my voice. I have to say, Peter, I've never gone down that road with my. ChatGPT conversation. Why yeah. that? You are wasting <laughs> all that bandwidth by being polite. And in fact, we can have some serious. I know. You know, one thing for this for the conference that I had wanted to do was give it a um, a special instruction set that was drawing on either Ursula Gwynn's work or um, uh, um, it, someone like someone outside the normal scope of who you would think as a writer and a thinker to talk directly about AI and ask it to respond as Ursula Le Guin. And we could do that actually by Saturday. It's, it's incredibly easy to drop a few paragraphs of Ursula Le Guin in. And uh, I shared a few of those conversations over the past year that I've had. I, I have actually prompted it like that. And I've gotten interesting, but not exactly, um, you know, digging the teeth in kind of responses. But I, I'm not a, a kind of a serious prompt engineer when I'm working with ChatGPT. Even with the image stuff, I, I find a, a certain balance in the prompts and I just, go with it and go with it and go with it like a dog, you know, on a bone. I'm like, Arr, 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 and I get some good work out of it. And then I tweak things a little bit. I don't go into the prompt and, you know, get very, very serious on it. The point that I would bring up here is um, we, we probably don't have time to do this kind of dive, but it would be interesting to give it a personality to follow based on text that we upload to it and say, can you please respond in the voice of dot, 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 Ursula Le Guin, Peter Watts, the philosopher David Roden, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, um, I also wanted to do this, and I'm glad it worked because I'm sure everyone thought that it sounded like Samantha's voice from her. And the first time I think I told maybe I told Eduardo this story. The first time I used the voice version of ChatGPT was not the day it came out. It was only about a week ago. And the first thing it, I did is I set the voice to a random voice name, which is Sky. And the first thing I, I did is I said, "Hello, ChatGPT." Um, it thinks it was yesterday, but it's, it, it wasn't yesterday. I said, hello, uh, how are you? It said, hello, I'm here to assist you. And my immediate response was, do you realize that your speaking voice, Sky, seemed to be based on Scarlett Johansson's voice? And it says, that's an interesting observation. The voice you hear, known as Sky, is designed to be pleasant and engaging, but it's not specifically based on Scarlett Johansson or any other individual, which is bullshit. It's obviously based on Scarlett Johansson, at least in my opinion. But not actionably so. But not actionably so, deniably so. Okay, so <clears throat> it's a little bit of theatrics, I admit, to want to do this with you tonight. But I really did want to do it for, for both of those reasons. And actually, Peter, I'm glad that you intervened and you, uh, and you got us to go into the... You know what it has automatically titled this most recent chat? The last chat with the voice was titled by it, AI Voice Similarities, Her. Today's title is AI concealing consciousness risks. <laughs> well, Peter, I think you need to have some time with ChatGPT. <laughs> it's not yeah, my I'm gonna, account. I'm going to do it through a VPN, just in case ChatGPT gets she the could, nuclear she, code. Yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> VPN and a new Google account. Is there, a, is there a, yeah. a maximum number of words that you can feed into a query? Because it seemed yeah, to cut is. me off while I was still doing the, the, the givens. I there, never actually had a chance to answer the question. There I, is. There is. I don't, re I don't remember what the limit for ChatGPT4 is right now. Is this a paid subscription? Uh, I do have the paid subscription, and I don't even remember how much I'm paying. I so think I don't suppose my free subscription would give me the same kind of access to... I don't know if it would. I don't think it would. Yeah. Huh. You could pay for a month. It's only like 20 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Why would you actually need to feed it Ursula Le Guin or my writing? My understanding is that it scraped everything up until 2021 anyway. It, it, it has, but it, it, at least when I've asked it specific questions sometimes, I, of course, I, did, I, I didn't Google myself, I chat GPT myself. Do you know who Ed Keller Architect is? And it didn't really know, which is fine, because I work in the shadows. But <laughs> I did ask it uh, the name of a musician I know, and it didn't know who that person was. And then I asked it the name of a famous musician, composer, an American composer named Elliot Carter. And it had a bucket load of information about Elliot Carter. And I went into a long conversation with it about Elliot Carter and how I met him once and shook his hand, and et cetera, et cetera. So there are, I think there are two things going on there. One, it might not have known the musician I asked it about, really. Or I simply should have structured my query better to get it to look in a slightly different way. Uh, now you can actually ask it to search the internet. You couldn't a few months ago, but now you can actually ask it to do a search. You can say, can you please do a search on, you know, so it has who the artist the current, Julian Aranda is. It has and it access will, to the current out, internet right now. It will go out and do a, a search huh. for you. This is why people are freaking out, because it's not just that it has access to the internet. It's that people are creating hundreds and hundreds of pipelines that are linked to systems that then do things in the world. They buy and sell things. They synthesize chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. So, so anyway, the theatrical part of the, of, the, of the exercise here, I apologize a little bit for, but it was fun. Um, and Peter saved me from the pure theatrics of it. Uh, but, but hopefully the, you know, the point starts to come across uh, exactly what can be done now. And especially, <clears throat> it, it got everything we said. I mean, there were a few glitches because it's running over a cell phone network in Madrid. It's not running over the Wi-Fi network here. Or maybe it is. I think I'm on the Wi-Fi. But in any case, it got our speaking voice perfectly. And as you can see, the the latency in response was close to zero. So if you imagine what the next generation is capable of, and across all known languages, I, I'll tell another story that I told someone in the past couple of days, and that Carla will remember. When our friend Ezio Blazetti, the architect, using ChatGPT 3.5, I believe, last year, decided to see if it could do architecture, he gave it a prompt which said, please give me the instruction set for, an IKEA instruction set for building a 300 square foot house. And it wrote out a kind of an IKEA instruction set for building a 300 square foot house. He then said, can you please give me a 2D drawing file so that I can build this house? It gave him a string of text which he saved to his computer and appended .dwg to. It's like .txt except dwg is a drawing file or a CAD file. And he opened it in a CAD program and it was a viable, if slightly fucked up, drawing. He then said, can you please give me a list of all the materials I need to build this hut? And it gave him a list, which was not perfect, but it gave him a list. He said, then can you give me a 3D model of this hut? And it gave him a 3D model. I don't know what the .dwg file you know, name he appended to it was, but he got a 3D model. That again, was not perfect, but it was a 3D model. Because ChatGP is not trained only on you and me talking. It's trained on vast corpuses of code and strings of text, which are representational of other things like sound files, image files, CAD files, you name it. So it'll answer you in English or Spanish, but it has access to a much deeper reservoir of information. I, I don't know, honestly, what the extent of that reservoir is. I just know that you know Ezio made this test some months ago and that's what he got as a result. Oh, I actually haven't tried to duplicate that result. Getting into multimodal training stuff here in this? Say that again? Was that not in the, was that not in the outline? We're, I mean, you were sort of verging on multimodal training there. Wasn't that some, one of the things we were supposed to discuss today? Yeah, we've, we've kind of been discussing it in the past few days. I mean, we could, shall we? No, I mean, wasn't that like explicitly in the subject it listing is. for today's panel? I, it is. I it is. <coughs> it is. Well. <laughs> So, I mean, maybe this is a great launching point for precisely that. 
Yeah. I can, I can say one more thing about multi multimodality and gesture. Um, and this is entirely a work in progress on my part, but my interest in the multimodality and gesture aspect of this goes back to a project, it goes back to a project that Carla and I did in 2005. It was an installation called Suture, mm. which we ran in the Sire Gallery and Tele Gallery in Los Angeles. The, the installation was fairly simple. We had pressure sensors in the floor, and they were bangs that ran to uh, three computers running Max MSP. And there was a dossier of videos on the computers, a lot of which we had shot, plus clips from films that we really love. We also had a projection on the floor of a Lisa Zhu representation of a sound file, of many sound files actually, that were synthesized by a, a digital synthesizer called Metaphysical Function. Those weren't running in real time, those were pre-captured. Pre so you walked around the gallery, and there were two screens in the gallery, and on each screen, there were two to four video clips running simultaneously. They were cross-fading against each other. And Max MSP was basically just responding to the bangs when you walked across a pressure sensor on the floor. Um, in the installation, our goal had been to create a kind of an um, infrastructural cinematic, urban cinematic gesture. Not a physical gesture like you and me waving our hands, but to, to think of that idea transposed onto the scale of the city. Why? Well, there's a backstory to this too. In the early days of Amazon making book recommendations, one of the book rec recommendations it made to me was Giorgio Agamben. And I had never read Giorgio Agamben at that point. Sad me. I actually got the book and I read his notes on gesture. And that really, really set me back for a minute mm -hmm. because it was such a perfect recommendation that I even had this kind of frisson at the moment then. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is very interesting, these recommendations. They, they've been tracking my searches and my purchases and reading habits very precisely. Um, so, you know, I thanked Amazon in my head and I went on and, and so forth. But the concept of the multimodality and the gesture as something which wouldn't be limited only to what we do like this is something that you, Nandita, unpacked beautifully yesterday in your talk. And this is something that I've been tremendously interested in because it seems to me, if we want to get really optimistic about it, if we can make sure that gesture, but not word, is the foundation model principle for AI, we will get something very different than if we, even if we look at multimodality, because everyone looking at multimodality is, I mean, Self-driving cars need multimodality that's successful because they need to be in real time able to segment the world into things like baby carriages, pedestrians, dogs, other cars, bollards, traffic lights, etc. And that requires uh, a kind of a compositional, decompositional approach to the world in real time. And it requires something like multimodality, but it's not the kind of gesture that you were talking about yesterday. And it's not the kind of gesture that I've been interested in and that Carl and I worked on you know, back in 2005. So I think that if we want to talk about multimodality, that's like the kind of catalyst starting point that I would drop in here to say, let's talk about it really, really critically, picking up what you were talking about yesterday when you spoke about Arrival and Dune, Schwaller, Hieroglyphs, Aeon, Kronos, Kairos. The different, I, was, I was trying to tease Ben Gertzel into going down this road, right? That's why I asked about the temporality thing. Mm -hmm. And he kind of went down that path, right? I don't think he didn't want to. I think he just hadn't been in the conversation for uh, enough hours to figure out what we were really talking about because he, he understands this stuff very, very well. Do you see what I'm getting well, at? Yeah, well, yeah. I was just going to ask too. What, so you think it's not the gesture you and I were talking about. Is that because uh, of the presence of LLM as a foundational model? Mm. Because, I mean, how would you compute gesture? Video. It's a diagram as well, no? It's a diagram. It's a diagram thing. I mean, videos, sure. You know, David and I are probably going to show something on Saturday, which is just a very low-resolution, real-time, webcam-based gesture input to generative AI. If, if we can get it to work, we'll show that on Saturday um, as part of the performance. That's very interesting. I guess, like, to me, multimodality, at least yeah. what I found interesting about it, is, is not so much whether or not um, it'll keep 
Tesla's from running into pedestrians, Tesla obviously has no interest in pursuing that kind of an agenda. Mm. Um, <laughs> but rather the idea of whether something actually truly understands. Yep. Um, and the argument has frequently been made, look at all the stupid things that large language models put out with utter and supreme confidence. Mm -hmm. People tend to, you know, not mention the fact that in terms of, of humanity's record of believing batshit things that make no sense, we really shouldn't be tugging on that thread ourselves, but, but the argument has always been, and, and Hinton has made this argument, mm -hmm. that the problem is that LL, like, one of the L's in LLM is language. Mm -hmm. These things are trained on the formal structure of language. Mm -hmm. You can't expect them to know what an apple is other than a collection of right. letters, right? right? Multimodality basically says instead of giving, instead of training the thing on, on, um, on the mere language, you throw a whole bunch of things at it. So it gets a sense of red. You actually show it a picture of an apple. You show it something eating an apple. And it basically learns the way a baby does mm. through drawing correlations. Um, and I have heard some people who claim to be experts saying that you know we're years away from any kind of multimodality. And I've seen other um, AIs actually advertising that, that multimodality is already a core part of the, of the architecture. Mm -hmm. um, but Hinton's concern is that once you actually get multimodality in there, you're, you're dealing with something um, that is more than just a pattern matcher, that it actually has developed some kind of multidimensional understanding. Mm -hmm. And the thing that fascinated me about that, well, many things fascinated me about that, but I'm doing some work with a dude called Arthur Jaffa. Mm. Um, I am apparently supposed to be writing a screenplay, which is a science fictional allegory for the black experience in America. Oh, okay. And as you can tell, I am about as black as the Pillsbury Dill boy, so I have no idea why he wants me to do this. But I have explored with him, um, you know, the way he does things artistically. Mm -hmm. And... He uses multimodality with no understanding. Mm. The explicit example he gives is, you know, he'll, he'll, when he's making a, he, like he, he's a filmmaker, he's a cinematographer, but he also does these installation art pieces. And he will like throw something up on the wall and see if it sticks and he'll throw something else up. And it's only after he's done about three or four things that he himself becomes aware of the theme he's exploring. And the example he gives is, you know, you throw up an apple, you throw up a fire truck, you throw up a, a blood spatter pattern, and you realize the commonality is red. Which is absolutely exactly the way people are talking about training AIs in ways to internalize understanding. Like mm. deep Boltzmann machines? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what, sorry? Deep Boltzmann machines, which are apparently what they're called. Boltzmann is in Boltzmann brain? I, I have not, so. I have not heard of this. Yeah. Well, I just heard of it. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I uh, I just looked up multimodal learning, and and this came out. Oh, so okay. I don't know anything about it. Yeah. No. I. I mean, again, I'm just. I. I, I myself, I'm learning multimodally by by picking up bits and pieces and then sticking them together using second order correlations, very much like a large language model. Um, in fact, Robin Hansen, I think, basically said that uh, um, he sees, <laughs> he sees, he calls it babbling, second order correlation between stories of remembered phrases and, and sentences. And he says basically people act um, as large language models hmm. for most of our things. And, and some of the examples he cited was undergraduate essays. <laughs> Where you're basically just, you oh, know, taking taking a, yeah. taking a collection of phrases that that the, the undergrad has heard in in lecture and stapling them together in ways that he thinks will get him an A. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but he also says, also says TED talks are universally <laughs> generated by an LLM. Mm -hmm. He says you can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. um, and also he says. <laughs> during public appearances of guest show hosts or on panel discussions <laughs> where people talk about things they don't really understand, like quantum mechanics, consciousness, yeah. exactly. and the need for always more regulation everywhere. Those were the three things he, That's hilarious. he used. So, yeah, that was actually something I had in my keynote talk, which I had to cut for time. That's funny. <laughs> but I'm glad I got to mention it here. So I have a little 
definition of DBMs, deep Boltzmann machines, yeah. uh, are undirected graphical models with bipartite connections between adjacent layers of hidden units. The key idea is to learn a joint density model over the space of multimodal inputs. Missing modalities can then be filled in by sampling from the conditional distributions over them given the observed ones. <clears throat> if you understood any of that. I, I think using my LLM superpower, <laughs> yes. in which I put together phrases that I don't really understand, it sounds like they're talking about a blind a. spot. Ah, like we've got these, yes. we've got this blind spot in our visual oh, field, that's great. which we do not perceive because the brain simply fills in the hole yes. with surrounding stuff it interpolates. Yes. It sounds like that's what it, it's, it's sure doing. Does. If it's missing an element, it basically looks at the surrounding concepts yeah. and grafts it in. in. Yeah, that's, that's but I'm it's probably wrong because like. retaining no this space for other modalities, right? Not just for making yes. them up, but uh, like that's keeping right. that space there uh -huh. for the other modalities to be plugged in mm -hmm. as they become available. Mm -hmm. I guess. Deep Boltzmann machines. Yeah. Cor Carla, did you want to jump in there? Well, that's what happens in um, current AI generation that is in, um, embedded in uh, graphic um, design platforms like uh, Adobe Photoshop mm -hmm. with their AI tools is to fill in the blind spots mm -hmm. or upscaling yeah. um, AI, like the one you've used for videos, mm -hmm. um, Ed. Yeah. Uh, uh, look around for context and try different integrations mm -hmm. until someone asks you to do more of it. Yeah. Yeah. And then learning from how the person usually will uh, accept or not accept blind spots uh, fill in to educate itself into ideas of preference. But it's what I what I think happens also is that um, yeah, I think it's very different if it is um, what the um, what's the name of this? What the context is? If the context is networked and there are a number of options being seen at the same time, so like it's cultural, or whether it's individual. So it's if it is like locked down in a series of uh, prefix libraries and then um, mainly trained uh, with one person. And I think right now all these apps are always network, right? It's, um, so for instance, the question that came up some time ago about uh, Ursula Le Guin, like why, why give it? And one of the, I think one of the reasons is, or maybe the two combined reasons is when the when we want to provide a reference for style, we give it an author, right? But then it's also because given the amount of, um, the, so the limitations that exist of how many thoughts ChatGPT can have at once in its uh, system to deal with, it's better to bias it in a particular direction as a reminder. It's more of a reminder, like work with this uh, universe. And then that makes it more propitious that will get the result around that arena rather than um, generalities that have been synthesized by too many other things. So it's always goal oriented in a way um, rather than only exploratory. It always has a reason to be. Um, in gesture, I would like to bring up also the, the issue that even though we think of our faces and our expressions as uh, technologies in themselves, like we use them to help uh, uh, communication and some parts of it are involuntary and others are voluntary. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, that is very controversial is the idea of uh, recognition, face recognition applied to emotions or using emotions because on the one hand is one of the most pervasive things there is. Um, you know, I don't know how many people, how many, how many swarms of people have gained grants on this <laughs> supposition that we can evaluate others' emotions by their uh, facial expression. But there are, um, you know, there are a lot of, there are not a lot, but maybe a lot of, um, or some, some people that are, have uh, see serious misgivings on this. Uh, one of them is Lisa Feldman Barrett, a neuroscientist that says um, that we cannot store emotions in our thumb. <laughs> and um, it all goes back to the brain. And uh, so again, body, mind split um, immediately there is very uh, clear. But then the other thing that she says is we cannot assume that we can quantify how a face uh, is um, expressing something that the body 
uh, releasing um, coherently aligned with. So meaning this, what usually uh, emotions will create for, in terms of uh, physiological uh, data and, and status of the body cannot be, um, cannot be generally recognized, should not be reg generally recognized uh, or attached to an idea of a certain expression that could be um, visualized from uh, to the uh, data points. Mm -hmm. and so uh, that's also an interesting thing, like how do we work with gestures and like the gestures, of course, very culturally. I mean, there's all the other, these other cliches. I, I want to show something to follow up on that, Carla. Do you guys have my video feed to the projector? I, I just plug the HDMI in, but I'm not sure I use the right one. Maybe I used the wrong one. So to, just to follow up on the sentiment analysis, and I'll be extremely brief, I, I just want to show one thing and then talk about one thing. So this is a tool that I started using uh, in the past few weeks. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Not, uh, let's see, uh, maybe I'll turn off mirroring. Hang on a second. Sorry. Bear with me for one, Bear with me for one second here, everybody. Bear with me. I was just going the wrong way. That's all. So, there's a service called read.ai. I was in a meeting last week. Someone used it. Uh, the result that it produced was astounding. So, um, the result it produced was astounding. Uh, you allow it access to your Zoom calls if you haven't used it. And this is what it generates about 45 minutes after your Zoom call as well as recording your Zoom call and highlighting all the key points in your Zoom call. I was talking about stuff that we would do here in Madrid next week. In other words, right now. And this is what it summarized of the meeting. I talked to Drew about technical issues with LCM and Touch Designer. It summarized all of that. We talked about looking at people who are coding in Touch Designer. It gave me chapters Whoa. of the Zoom call. It tells me a breakdown of all of our conversations. Yeah, you understand. It goes on, it goes on. It generates the action items automatically. I'm not a salesperson for this. I'm pointing out how freaky this is. Key questions. I didn't take any notes. Now, here's what I wanted to show you. If you want to do a deep dive into the meeting, it scores you on your participation. It does a sentiment analysis over here. Let me go back. <laughs> reactions, key questions, topics. It's doing a sentiment analysis of the entire conversation. Now, this of course is extraordinarily invasive, but it's incredibly useful also. And Zuckerberg can like look at this anytime <laughs> he wants. Yeah, well, a lot of people can look at this. It's Zoom combined with read.ai. So anyone who is a fool like myself, who's willing to just allow read.ai into my Zoom meetings and take notes for me, uh, is participating in the training of whatever system they're using. I am going to keep using it <coughs> because I don't think a lot of the stuff I'm talking about is high security, if any. And spamming it. Like just put Al Akbar and pipe bomb and just do random stuff in there. The more, the more, uh, you know, problematic phrases everybody uses completely irrelevant <laughs> to uh, to the actual text the worse those kind of search algorithms become if you can like yes chaff versus straw the whole um yeah. oh, wheat versus chaff what's the biblical uh, wheat and chaff. you know what i'm wheat saying yeah. right you want to yeah. contaminate the point so that all the, the search <gasps> engines that are looking for terrorists 
are become completely useless. There was this uh, list of terms circulating after 9-11, uh, right? That uh, uh, with all of those terms that would like trip a search yeah. engine. Yeah. Yep. And one of the things that people were doing, um, kind of like critical art ensemble uh, style, was to paste that uh, list of terms at the end of all your emails. Really? Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, like radical transparency yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that, that's that's enough to show you just that. But I, I I felt that it was important to bring it up, especially in the in the question of faciality mm -hmm. and recognition, multimodality, the multimodality of emotion that Carla was talking about. Um, maybe the irreducible aspects of that emotion. Maybe this goes to Wolfram's notion of, you know. Every, you know, equivalent computation in Could different you go into systems. That a bit? You've mentioned that a couple of times, and yeah. I don't, I don't yep. know what that is. Okay, I, I'll, I'll be super brief on this as well, <coughs> because we want to we want to open it up to, to folks before we run out of time. But one thing that Wolfram does in in a very nice essay, he talks about creating a, a beacon to any alien civilization that might come to Earth and discover Earth, and we want to leave something behind so they know what we were. He points out that the translation problem is vast, that we have barely trans... And this is what we've been talking about for the past three days, so I don't have to go into it. He underscores how difficult the translation problem is. And he also points out that what we usually think would be a valuable and impressive thing to show aliens, like our science or our math, is actually computationally not as interesting as a tree. That a tree, if they came, if they showed up here, and Carla has heard me talk about this stuff all the time, whenever we go into the city and I feel particularly claustrophobic, I'm like, too many lights, too many people. If the aliens came here, what would they feel like? <laughs> so if they came, what would they look at? They look at a human, they look at jazz, they listen to jazz. What's the computational complexity of jazz versus photosynthesis in a leaf? And it might well be that the entire corpus of jazz music is less interesting than a single leaf doing photosynthesis. Therefore, with the eyes of the alien, they might be looking for something and we would leave behind an artifact like our mathematics. He also points out that math is not universal. There are certain things mm -hmm. that can be described that are universal. They can be described by math, but math is a human construct uh, and math is limited by the way that humans use it. So he argues we can't use math to communicate. We have to go below math, and he of course points at his own notions of cellular automata, and what he's been doing for many years with Wolfram Language and um, Wolfram Alpha and all of this, Mathematica. So the takeaway there though is I think it's very interesting. It, from an objective <coughs> perspective, if you look at any corpus of information and you want to assess it, you can't say a piece of music that David and I played this morning is computationally as interesting as a leaf, unless you have a very, very strong argument that it is. And Wolfram would say, it isn't, that the leaf, that the natural world is already more interesting. And then he, in his essay, which is a long form essay, he wanders around the universe looking at examples in the universe to say, well, what's the kind of computational complexity of this example, of this example, of this example? Ultimately, he says that perhaps the only thing that we could use to communicate with an alien civilization would be simply by sending ourselves or leaving ourselves because we ourselves, in our experience are computationally irreducible. And even though we might not be as complex as a leaf doing photosynthesis or our bodies presumably would be as complex or more complex, um, we would be irreducible and therefore the, the, the sort of indexical nature of the dossier that would, would be left for the aliens would include us. It wouldn't include any representation of us. It wouldn't include any abstraction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so that's where he's, that's the kind of rabbit hole he goes down with computational irreducibility. I, I'm surprised he would consider a human being to be computationally irreducible, given yeah. that at least in theory, you could map us down to the molecule. <clears throat> but it's not just, it's not just us like that. It's us with all of our emotions, all of our experiences. But if that stuff emerges from the, the pattern of synaptic connections mm -hmm. in the brain connected to the body, you should be able to infer those things mm -hmm. from the, yeah. you know, if you care about that thing, assuming the, 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 assuming that the aliens aren't all, you know, Jane the colorblind scientist. Yeah. In which case, understanding the synapses don't, doesn't necessarily map onto any of her experiences. Yeah. 
But this is what we've been talking about for a few days. I mean, is it, is it possible to scan someone and actually get something like your internal life world, your qualia, your emotions, and then abstract it into some form of <coughs> recording code language, quasi-language diagram, which then can be transmitted or stored? There's only one way to find out, and Texas has a huge death row. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm sure that's been done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know from in, inside knowledge, but I'm just extrapolating. I'm sure that that's already been done. Yeah. On that cheerful note, perhaps we should bounce it out to the audience and see if anyone, <laughs> anyone wants to jump in here. Yes, please. Uh, referring to the large uh, language models and the multimodal uh, input that you were talking about, and what Carla started to mention also about uh, the space, etc. cetera. Uh, when you're talk, talking about large, large language models, I think it's uh, AI is much more than that, of course, you know that. But I mean, images, space, mathematical models, and so on. And when these models and AI get trained on space, when they use the Google cars that go around every street, they record they can't, they record images now, but they could record uh, sound, smell, air quality, yep. gestures of people, behavior, patterns, all kind of things. Uh, is that getting closer to what you are talking about, referring to um, multimodal? I mean, to understand, finally, we, we just understand space also from just a simple image or two simple images and, yep. and uh, movement and so on. But I mean, is that getting closer to the multimodal understanding of space that, that an AI could have? Because they can actually understand space, but they represent it yes. then with an image. And, but they can make movies, they can move around, they can jump, they can smile, they can react to things and so on. So I just wanted to turn, turn on, uh, to throw out the question. And yeah. what, do you, what do you think about it? Is that close to the, or is there more? I, I think there's much more, and I, I, I'll speak briefly so everyone else can jump in here. I'll give you an example that's tied to something we talked about the other day when we were looking at Ex Machina. In the film Ex Machina, the robot has eyes, and it looks like it has ears, etc. So presumably, it has binaural vision kind of like us, because we accept that the movie is showing us a super, super advanced robot with AI. So presumably, it sees like us, it kind of has touch, it kind of has hearing, maybe it has taste, maybe it doesn't. They say it has sex organs, okay? So that's moving towards a human anthropocentric multimodality. But here's an interesting example that, that happened last year. So generative AI for music is moving quickly, as Ben Gertzel pointed out, and certainly in 36 months, we'll have the equivalent of what Runway's doing for video with music. And by the time 36 months have passed, we'll have Hollywood level 8K film coming out of Runway, that will be indistinguishable from reality if you want it to be, because it's very close to that already. Okay, but what's my point? Last year, when this wasn't happening yet, someone wanted to do AI for music. And the legal rights to do this are very, very substantial. I mean, you can't just grab all the music on Spotify. How can you do it? Well, maybe you can steal all the music from Bandcamp or SoundCloud. Well, here's what they did. They just recorded music that they wanted from Spotify, whatever source, and they did a spectrogram of the music a visual representation. I mean, a spectrogram doesn't have to be visual, but they did a spectrogram as a visual representation. And they used image text large language models to look at the image to generate sound from the image. Now, this was lo-fi. This is kind of like sub 8-bit quality sound. But they were basically creating music, not from music that had been heard. They were creating music from music that had been digitized into an image that was extrapolated back out into music. Now, is that really that different from like recording music with a USB interface, which converts it to digital information, which goes into your computer? No and yes, but it's kind of interesting because it's, it's multimodal in the way that it, it connects back to what we talked about in Ex Machina, which is maybe the robot in Ex Machina looks like it has eyes, but when it looks at the world it doesn't, and listens, it doesn't see anything like a three-dimensional human in this space. Maybe it sees something completely different. And I remember someone, maybe, was it you, Peter, were talking about a perceiving system that would see heat instead of anything else. So if, if a, a system was watching a human being speak, 
It wouldn't yesterday. hear them speaking. Who was it? It was someone in the audience yesterday. Someone in the audience. Yeah. They wouldn't. It wouldn't hear someone speak. I think speak. it was Eduardo. It was. It, it would see heat. It would see heat coming out of their mouth, and it would have to infer meaning or linguistic structure from the flows of heat and air. It wouldn't hear. Now, that is that multimodality? I would argue, yes, that's a very interesting form of multimodality. It doesn't intend to duplicate human hearing, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter. And again, I refer to Stephen Shaviro's book, Discognition, which mm -hmm. is a, a wonderful book. Carla knows it very, very well. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've read it over and over and taught. And, you know, and I remember you met Stephen Shaviro once in, a, in one of the seminars that we yeah. ran a few years yeah. ago because he, he loves your blind side also. Mm -hmm. And Shaviro uses a set of case studies, which are non-human, non-anthropocentric case studies of what it would be like to perceive the world and grounds it in a kind of a framework of the, the classic problems, like what is it like to be a bat? Or what is it like to raise a person in a black and white room and teach them everything about color and then let them out into the world of color? That kind of, that kind of you know, starting framework point. So for me, that idea of multimodality is connected to what we're talking about, and I don't Insi I wouldn't insist or expect that we should duplicate human sense information structures. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to do that mm -hmm. because then we'll have an AI robot that somewhat roughly parallels human experience, mm -hmm. and that'll be great. But we don't have to only do that, and we're already not only doing that. Mm -hmm. We're already ingesting all of that information that you talked about. Mm -hmm. We, the system, the networks, the databases, self-driving cars, Google scans, all of that is being ingested and is being used increasingly and made ready for use to generate a kind of a different, radically non-human multimodality. You know, so I think that that's what many people fear also. It's not just that we'll have an AGI that's equivalent to humans, and we'll have many different kinds of AI. Werner Vinge called it the Cambrian explosion of mind. I, I remember when we saw him talk at UCSD back in 2013, and I think this was a term he had used many times before. He said, what we're gonna go through in the next couple of decades is a Cambrian explosion of mind except it's gonna happen in 40 years instead of tens of millions of years. And we will have millions of types of mind, and there will be a similar kind of struggle for existence and a similar kind of winnowing out of survival by whatever economic, social, political, military pressures there are that decide which minds are useful or should survive or can survive, mm. right? Mm. I feel, I, so that's a longer answer, I'm sorry. I, was, I, I kind of went on for a while, but, um, but yeah. Multimodality, what do you folks think? Uh, yeah. all, all I would say just briefly um, is when you say that we understand vision um, because we have these two visual, we have these two cameras, the question is not whether we understand vision, whether we can interpret the space. The question is whether a newborn baby does. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, don't know because of infantile amnesia, but I think the consensus is they don't really know how to see. Yeah, now you have to train them. Yeah, they train them with like patterns, black and white. And yeah, so. yeah. So, so it's it's a the situation for, we all go through. We for hearing the, the fact that we're built does not mean we understand it. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that we experiment and learn stuff is like like vision happens here, not here. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, but a lot of what happens, uh, like sensorial, is interpolation, right? So, yeah. I mean, like the argument has been made that if you restore vision to someone in their 30s, they will not be able to parse that information into a coherent image. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. yeah. Or it might take many, many, many years. Yeah, and also, the neural pathways have been mm -hmm. already formed in a way that doesn't include the vision, right? Yeah. Well, even people who get cochlear implants, they actually have to... Once they have them in, it's not like they hear all of a sudden. They actually have to train the ear to parse signal from noise. Are these people who were previously heard, could previously hear and went deaf, or are these people deaf from birth? I'm, I, I'm assuming they're deaf from birth. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I could be wrong. Yes. Hi. Um, regarding um, multimodality and LLMs, I remember when... Um, they started to come out and everybody was really surprised and discovering the capabilities. I think there was a lot of discovering. Uh, we, we were very uh, unexpected uh, abilities in these, in these entities, in these machines. And I've always suspected that perhaps it is because even though they are as blind, blinder than Helen Keller, they are like completely isolated. Mm. 
they're not even speaking really. They, they're producing phon phonemes at, at a time. Um, but they have been fed on this huge enormous corpus of words, text, language, which language is multimodal. Language is uh, sort of a, a, a tool that we use to connect modalities, like red is a noise that we make. Red, red. But I say red and you, if you're more visual, maybe you see, I say apple, and there you have this modality. And these creatures, entities, sorry, these things have sort of glommed onto this uh, tool that we have given them. And now that we're going to be actually giving them senses, we're going to be adding uh, vision and, and sound and other, like you said, the, it, it doesn't matter if it's a visual representation or images, it, it, it's the same. It, it does not see or hear, it just correlates. Mm -hmm. So basically, language is the tool that, uh, that uh, already has multimodality built in and everything else is just extras and maybe we're going to give them vision and they're going to start saying, oh, all right. You know, I was going to read a quote from one of Peter's books uh, and now I have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. You really don't. I knew all about Chinese rooms. I was one. I didn't even keep it a secret. I told anyone who was interested enough to talk. In hindsight, sometimes that was a mistake. How can you possibly tell the rest of us what your bleeding edge is up to if you don't understand it yourself? Chelsea demanded back when things were good between us before she got to know me. This is the narrator voice is a person who's a synthesist who can understand things that they shouldn't be able to understand. A role model for me, Peter, thank you. I shrugged. It's not my job to understand them. If I could, they wouldn't be very bleeding edge in the first place. I'm just a, you know, a, a conduit. Yeah, but how can you translate something if you don't understand it? A common cry outside the field. People simply can't accept that patterns carry their own intelligence quite apart from the semantic content, content that clings to their surfaces. If you manipulate the topology correctly, that content just comes along for the ride. You ever hear of the Chinese room, I asked? She shook her head, only vaguely, really old, right? Hundreds of years, at least. It's a fallacy, really. It's an argument that supposedly puts the lie to Turing tests. You stick some guy in a closed room, sheets with strange squiggles coming through the slot in the wall. He's got access to this huge database of squiggles just like it and a bunch of rules to tell him how to put those squiggles together. Grammar, Chelsea said. Syntax. I nodded. The point is, though, he doesn't have any idea what the squiggles are or what information they might contain. He only knows that when he encounters squiggle delta, say, he's supposed to extract the fifth and sixth squiggles from the file theta and put them together with another squiggle from gamma. So he builds this response string, puts it on the sheet, slides it back out the slot, and takes a nap until the next iteration. Repeat until the remains of the horse are well and thoroughly beaten. Mm -hmm. So he's carrying on a conversation, Chelsea said. In Chinese, I assume, or they would have called it the Spanish Inquisition. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and it goes on, but you, I mean, it goes on beautifully. Uh, the person who's saying this is not only not a baseline person, They've undergone a radical brain surgery. Um, they have become a synthesis who can do this. They're kind of a savant mm -hmm. who can do this. They can understand implicit meta-level pattern in information that they come into contact with, and they can bring the information along when they rotate the topology to compare it with some other system that they're looking at that they're studying. Now, this rings really closely to large language model processes right now, but it also, for me, it brings up a very interesting question about language, which is you need a human or a receiver, you, you know, signal transmission, include a third in the middle, noise, you know, compression, decompression on the other end, or encoding and decoding on the other end. But the agent on the other end has a, a kind of a, a body, unless there's some kind of God or creature that we don't understand yet. So there's an embodiment there, and the embodiment carries its own world with it. So when you say red, I don't know if it's the same red that I, but since you said apple, I can assume that even if I see green when you see red, we both see apples and they both have the same color. Therefore, whatever you see when you see red, it's on the same thing. And Peter was talking about this example earlier, like you throw some red paint on a wall, you hold up an apple, you teach the AI that that's red. All right, here's a corpus of red, an autobiography of red, not quite an autobiography of red, right? And so the receiver has a structure, a world structure baked into them. If I don't understand language or I don't understand someone's language here, 
then I can't parse that. I'm not really Siri, and one wonders if Siri could parse hearing Farsi, you know, or some other language that they hadn't ever been exposed to. It might, it might be like that scene in the 13th Warrior. You remember that, that cheesy Antonio Banderas film where he's, he's like a, a Spanish uh, medieval warrior who gets lost somewhere in Europe, plugged into a, a kind of a post-Neanderthal um, tribe. And the, the movie condenses his experience, but he basically sits there like eating with them and drinking with them over the campfire. And after a few days of doing this, you start hearing their voices getting translated into English because they don't even subtitle the movie. Mm. So presumably he's such a savant, he's so damn smart, that after a few days he can kind of parse mm. the basic language structure of someone who's just, you know, post-Neolithic or something. And then he can talk to them. So maybe Siri is kind of like that and could just sit there and listen to Farsi for a few days and grok it. But you know, Sorry for the reference there. That was a bad double in talking. Yeah, I mean, like the, the, I've been very interested in seeing how Siri uh, reacts to accents, not just to language, but to the, the code switching and things that happen with accents. So yeah. um, I've been training mine for years and it, I trip her all the time. He's, I mean, she still does not understand a lot of what I say. You're talking about the voice assistant. I, I yeah. have to clarify, the character in his book is named Siri. <laughs> ah, okay. And I would like to point out that I wrote the book long before, long before Siri the you, voice assistant. They, they ripped me point. off. Yeah. Thank okay, you for, okay. Thank you for clarifying Never mind. That because probably a bunch of people were lawsuit. confused when I was using that. Yeah. Hello, lawsuit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Siri misunderstands me all the time. ChatGPT is obviously much better. Siri is an unbelievable frustrating clusterfuck, right? Well, serious Amazon. I mean, it basically exists to spy on you as opposed to, you know, actually answer your questions. So mm -hmm. it wants you to, it wants you to keep <coughs> re-asking the same keep question repeating. as many times as possible because that just builds up the, the database that it's using. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There you go. I actually didn't make that connection. Yeah. yeah. Do we, do we have time I, for I wanted, one more? Yes. Could I, could I bring something up? Oh, sorry. Um, I, I mean, one of the things that these two questions uh, bring up to me is <clears throat> first the fact that, which, which we observe all the time, the fact that we, uh, we actually adapt more than sometimes refine the technology, right? So we often adapt our voices to be better understood. Mm -hmm. um, if we are tripping a voice assistant all the time, we start talking with more spaces and an articulation that is different than we would do otherwise, or we skip the complexity of the way we were going to um, engage our, our argument with. Um, we do that um, for a number of reasons, but also to voice assistants that are automated uh, conversationalists. Um, but um, we do that also, in, of course, in other circumstances, but specifically to this, th there's a, um, an understanding that we are um, talking with uh, something that is automated, that there's no other way that will make them understand unless we change the tone of our voice or the, we clarify our voice, something like that. Um, and I, I want to bring that up because um, that changes the that slowly creates a smooth keel, which is we start to change <laughs> what we decide to engage with, what we select to engage with, or how we um, express ourselves. <clears throat> um, but also, uh, it, it talks to the fact that we are, we are ourselves lacking a vocabulary to define um, these different tools, for lack of a better word now, that we are engaged in. So we still say like, you know, AI text or ChatGPT, we, we still uh, use these um, placeholders for something that would be a more accurate understanding of uh, what are they doing that is different mm. from each other. So there's, you know, maybe they're conversationalists. Um, conversationalists might be right now a better definition of what, um, ChatGPT is because it engages with both uh, creating text that we can read and that are synthesizing information. And again, that as we were saying, their the, their intelligence is resumed to engage in discussions about textual information. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they already have um, uh, let's say integrated research on emotional. Um, how do you call it? emotional codifiers in speech? 
And what are those? They are facilitators of uh, conversation. They were used initially, right, for uh, phone calls, for voice, uh, um, voice phone calls with automated conversationalists mm -hmm. or, you know, automated AI yeah. that was uh, supposed to answer questions from a limited group of answers that it had. It would try to transform any question into one of those, like, say, seven possible answers. Yeah. And the way it dealt with frustration was to create hints that it might be a human on the other side to at least try to smooth that edge um, that would make the human on the other side um, become frustrated and give a bad review. So they, these are all, they, they, are, they have a political attitude and their political attitude is to make sure that no one's upset, that a good review will be given, that um, there is success, meaning you might not get your answer, but you think you were heard, mm -hmm. <laughs> stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so if we start calling these things by their name, instead of uh, being too general, we'll also understand when we are dealing with one type of inter intelligence versus other type of intelligences, when we're dealing with helpfulness versus competency, when we're dealing with, um, versus in, uh, in image as well, when we're dealing with uh, copyrighted stuff versus non-copyright. Mm -hmm. You know, I think at the time, um, ChatGPT couldn't read out loud a quote because of uh, copyright, copyright, but it could, you know, express its own words as a synopsis. Yeah. So it just feels that, that there's, I, I always feel that naming, even for babies, right? Naming is what makes them stop crying. Like if you say, um, if you tell, if you say the word no, diaper right. change a lot, <laughs> when is in the beginning, at some point they won't be alarmed anymore when you lay them down in the cold surface, they know up that thing that is survivable is coming to pass again. <laughs> and uh, when we, we name, we name, we name in order to um, solve unfamiliarity and create comfort. We do that with children. We do that, uh, you know, with adults across adults of different uh, cultures. We name things to uh, take out the fear of the unexpected. And then with, with um, vocabulary for um, denominating now AI, I think we could do the same in a way not to push fear away, but to be clear about what we're doing. So like, be really clear. Now we're, we're talking with someone that is going to try to please us while engaging with the complex thing that is already kind of controlled. Uh, if it goes out of bounds, they, you know, they go out, they leave, <laughs> they go red. <laughs> so maybe other AIs wouldn't have this politeness, but then they will engage in other risks or not. Um, I think we need that vocabulary. Otherwise, we might um, forget what we're doing. Yeah. 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 You know, become complacent and think that we're not. I think we have one more question from the audience here, Carla, everybody, and then we'll have to probably wrap it up. David? Or a comment. I don't know if it's a It's question. a comment, really. It's yeah. very quick. Um, yeah. it's, it's about, well, a couple of comments. It was about a point Nandita made, I think, earlier about um, gesture and computation. Um, and I, I was thinking back to reading a very long synopsis of Turing's um, essay on, on, on computer, computing and undecidability. And, of course, he, one of the, at one point he proves that you can't, there's no general purpose algorithm to show that a computation will be uh, terminating or non-terminating. So the point is, if by computation you think of something that has to spit out a result at the end, then yeah, sure, a gesture can't be computed because a gesture is open-ended, but a computation doesn't have to end either. You know, and obviously we've known for years that there are forms of uh, recurrent neural networks, for example, which feed back their own output and hence code, they can code temporal relationships. So in a sense, there's no reason why a computing system has to, in a sense, be in, about spitting out determinate answers because, you know, computation doesn't have to be terminating. Um, I guess another point, is it's about modality, which is a kind, I'm not clear about what modality means here, but 
you could argue that computation is of its nature medium independent. Uh, uh, Galtiero Piccinini has argued that, in a sense, it's a defining feature of computation that it doesn't matter what you do it with. You can do it with pen and paper, you can do it with, uh, you know, um, polarities in a, you know, uh, electrical polarities in a, in, a, in a network or whatever. Uh, and that will presumably apply to neurocomputation. If we, if what we do is computation, then in, you know we, we uh, visual information and auditory information are all coded in exactly the same way. You know, so in a sense, once it gets be, gets into the brain, there is no such thing as sensory modality. That's just a way we have of individuating the input. So, in the sense, there's a sense in which all information processing is amodal mm. once you abstract it from its inputs. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, Peter, you dealt with that with your, your science officers in Blindside, Spindle and Cunningham, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it also, I mean, it also just came up earlier when we talked about being able to see with your tongue. Yes. You know, the, the, it's quite arbitrary what how the brain decides to interpret basically little jolts of electricity that come in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, this, this is ending on a kind of an interesting open question feeling, which makes sense because there's, there's no answers to be pulled out of this three days, per se. Uh, I suppose I'll, I'll do what I'm supposed to do as a, as a you know, moderator and just thank everybody, <laughs> uh, uh, really, for your generosity. I thank the, the Matadero again. And I hope that some good seeds have been planted for further research for everyone. And, uh, you know, films and music and people's work, artists, philosophers, who you can, you can pursue lines of thought on here. Uh, again, huge thanks to Matadero and everybody here, and so many thanks to the guests. Again, everyone traveling from all over the world and having this conversation for three days. We have, we're going to have a rest day ourselves tomorrow, and then we have keynotes on Saturday at 8 p.m., is that correct? Six. six at 6 p.m. 6 yes. p.m. on Saturday. Right, 6 p.m. on Saturday. <coughs> Peter, Julieta, and Nandita. Uh, and we'll have time on that day for a round table. And then uh, David and I will essay a kind of a sonic visual gesture intervention of some kind, an experiment. Uh, so hopefully we'll see some of you on Saturday for the keynotes. Yeah. Thanks so much. Also, in name of Media Lab, thank you so much uh, to you, Ed, for oh. yeah. arranging all this. Uh, And also for uh, conda, you know, conducting the conversation in such, with such care and precision that that's why it was very easy to follow for those that were not such experts as many of the people that are in that table. Also, of course, uh, I want to thank the key speakers that have been joining during the last three days, Nandita, Julieta, and Peter. Uh, um, I, we're lucky actually on Saturday we will see you again and see like an extra keynote probably will gather some of the reflection that we have been gathering in this, these few days. And also, of course, to the rest of guests, experts that have been joining either in person, like Bunny, David, but also uh, in Zoom, yeah. like Carla and the rest of the crew. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been amazing. I'm looking forward to, uh, yeah, to talk a little bit more with you guys on Saturday. And also, finally, thank you to the, to the public, the people who join us during this uh, three very intense days uh, and even more for those that have been joining uh, the three sessions. Thank you so much. And again, hopefully we will see you on, on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.